Hey guys, welcome to the KNH Movement Podcast. Today we're on episode 18 and we have a very special guest, uh, Paul Saladino. He's uh, finishing his residency in functional medicine. Um, he's an awesome guy and he dropped a lot of knowledge bombs today. So I highly recommend you listen to it. It is a bit long. It's almost two hours. Uh, we had to take a break in the middle of it actually, but um, it was incredible to chat with him. Uh, he has a lot of information that's backed by science and research. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, have a great day. <laughs> oh man, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, hopefully, funny. hopefully I can tree up with some some science knowledge that uh, I know you're good for. So I, I just finished listening to your Mark Bell podcast again, and uh, I probably shouldn't have because I know I'm going to ask you a lot of the same questions that you guys talked about. Um, and I love to bring new knowledge to the table, but I felt like it was so valuable everything that was there. Um, and you covered so many topics that I think aren't traditionally covered in, in say like scientific podcasts. Yeah. Um, and you cover a lot of things that are now, I would say, quote unquote, trending. So like carnivore um, yeah. and people leaning away from, you know, say fruits and vegetables just because of their personal health. Um, so I guess the more most important question would be, you know, what's your background? How did you get involved with functional medicine? And uh, I know you have a pretty interesting story about how you, you ended up getting your MD. Yeah, so my background is uh, circuitous to say the, to say the least. I uh, uh, I I went to college on the East Coast at William Mary and studied chemistry, and then graduated from there and thought I was going to go to med school. My dad's a doctor, and then I decided that I was just not going to go to medical school at that point. And so I had six years of adventure where I was just pretty much a gallivanting vagabond. I just skied and traveled and. I threw hike to the Pacific Crest Trail one year from Mexico to Canada, if people know about that, and I was wow. a ski bum in Jackson Hole and Telluride and Oregon, and yeah, and then eventually I, um, I went back to graduate school, and I went and I did a PA degree, so I did a master's, and I got a physician assistant degree at George Washington University first, um, and that was my first, uh, you know, sort of foray into medicine. And I loved it, but pretty quickly, uh, as I was practicing in cardiology, I, I just, I guess it's just my personality. I'm, I'm obsessed with root cause, and I am really, really interested in finding out what works. And though uh, pharmaceuticals are fascinating, and a lot of the pharmaceuticals can help us elucidate the mechanisms that things are happening through, I was much more interested in what was going on with, with what, you know, in the atherosclerotic lesions of my cardiology patients and the hypertension at the root cause than I was in you know, the newest, greatest, you know, statin or beta blocker or ACE inhibitor or right. angiotensin receptor blocker. And so pretty quickly as a physician assistant, um, I was living in Flagstaff at the time and that was during my ultra running days. I've since re retired from ultra running. I don't do that anymore. I do other stuff that's like much easier on my body. Right. But, uh, I was like, you know, I, I realized pretty quickly, I was like, ah, I got to go back to medical school. So I went back to medical school uh, at the University of Arizona, uh, which I thought would be a good place because it's kind of a home of integrative medicine and there were people who thought integrative, like-minded, you know, there were like-minded uh, integrative individuals there. So I went to medical school there for four years and then while I was there, I knew I wanted to do integrative medicine. I kind of knew of functional medicine, which if people are not familiar is like root cause medicine. And I knew about that before I went to medical school and, um, and I wasn't sure what specialty I was going to go into. I thought maybe I was going to go into internal medicine or maybe family medicine, there's even a specialty of preventive medicine now, but ultimately I decided on psychiatry because I got so interested in story and the human side of medicine that that really drew my interest. And so I'm in the last few months of my, now what's been a four year psychiatry residency, so four years of medical school, four years of residency, and I'm finishing that at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I think that there's so many interesting implications for carnivore, autoimmunity, inflammation in all sorts of diseases, but especially mental health stuff. But I think of it very broadly and um, like to think outside the box in terms of all the diseases. So that's where I'm at now. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, congrats. Uh, it sounds like you're in the home stretch and you can finally, you know, finish up with the uh, school residency for good. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, know, I know how hard that, that path can be. I have a lot of friends that came out of medical school and um, you know, some of them who did psychiatry, some of them who did dentistry. Um, so it's a long journey, but it right. must feel good to uh, to be at the home stretch. So yeah, man, I'm um, stoked. Yeah, and that's that's really interesting that uh, you know your background led you there. It sounds like you know your your main passion is just finding you know why things are occurring rather than trying to treat them at a surface level, which I think um, doctors are more prone to do these days. And same with research. You know, when I did my master of science, we found that all the labs that got a bulk of the funding. You know, they were trying to find 
different mechanisms um, that were far outside of exercise or diet. Um, mm -hmm. They wanted to be able to fix something in the body and mimic caloric restriction through a pill rather than, you know, putting someone on a, a diet or giving right. them, let's say, more meat and less wheat. Um, so some right. things that I believe are even uh, more simple and they're overcomplicated. I understand that there's uh, the idea of willpower and discipline involved and you can't necessarily expect everyone to abide by a diet, but um, I hate that the first line of defense is oh always, God. here's a drug. It's such a bummer. And <clears throat> I mean, I don't, we don't need to get into like a political, you know, pulling mick here, but I think that it's yeah. driven by the insurance system and the fact that, you know, <clears throat> pharmaceuticals are easy to prescribe. And, uh, you know, in an insurance based world here in the United States, a lot of people that find their physician are not aware of the options for them and that we don't get a lot of nutrition training in medical school. We don't get much of anything. I mean, there was maybe a little bit more at the University of Arizona because there's some mm -hmm. integrated focus, but you know, the, to be honest, most of my training in nutrition has been postgraduate through the Institute of Functional Medicine. My training in functional medicine has been after medical school and residency, not through my residency, but through the Institute of Functional Medicine and stuff and just sort of personal personal dives into that kind of stuff. So I, doctors are just not trained, you know, there's so many really intelligent, well-meaning doctors out there, but they just don't even, we are not trained in this and so we don't even know what's out there. So it's really tragic, but hopefully right. we're changing that. Right, exactly. Uh, and I think there is a shift uh, thanks to technology, things like YouTube and podcasts. I, I mean, know. It's probably yeah. some of the best places to find new knowledge that's supported by science, not just people talking, you know, yeah. to, to push an agenda of some sort. Um, so I know you said, you know, you're doing your um, psychiatry residence. Mm -hmm. And recently I was talking to um, a psychiatrist, um, a friend of mine, and we were talking about the, the concept of uh, depression and anxiety and how things have never been better from a technological standpoint or an economic standpoint, if you want to talk about where we're at in the world in 2019. But in terms of depression, anxiety, I think it's it's been at an all time high. Yeah. Um, the number of stories that you hear about, obviously, there's more news outlets and you're always on your phone. So you hear about it more. Right. But generally speaking, I think the number of people that are prescribed with antidepressants, the number of people that feel anxious um, and the number of people that just generally don't feel good or are on the path towards depression, um, say they just have general sadness. I think is way too high, especially with how good we have it um, in life in terms of, you know, food and, oh, and, yeah. and medicine in North America. Um, I know technology has a lot to do with it. Uh, people spend way too much time on Instagram looking at, you know, the best version of other people. Um, I think it triggers a lot of things subconsciously. Sure. Whether or not you can accept it when you look at someone who you think is living an amazing life or they're on vacation or they just got married and you feel like you're maybe behind on life's, um, it can definitely trigger some things that you don't necessarily realize are there, especially when it's chronic. Uh, but I think it also has a lot to do with what we're putting in our bodies now. Food has never been more processed and um, food has never been easier to access. Like say fast food is everywhere and there's not a lot of meaning behind the wholeness of food anymore. So in your line of work and in your experience, you know, how would you relate what you're seeing in the trend of say depression anxiety and how it relates to what we're physically consuming in our bodies with food oh i totally agree i think it's hugely related so the interesting thing about psychiatry is that we don't at least mainstream psychiatry doesn't have blood work tests for depression and anxiety so what one psychiatrist sees as depression may be a little bit different than what another psychiatrist sees as depression but what I see in my practice is that there definitely are different types of depression. And I believe strongly that there is a sub subtype of depression that is fairly common, which is biologic in nature, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which is immune, which is autoimmune, which is inflammatory. And I think there are other subtypes of depression which are not necessarily as biologic. These are sort of socially created. We could call these endogenous versus exogenous depression, which is right. an old terminology that I think still fits, you know, like. Mm -hmm. I think everyone can say they've been quote unquote depressed at some point Absolutely. in their life. You know, yeah. I was a little depressed before this call, quote unquote, because I broke yeah. surfboard. <laughs> I just bought, right? Yeah. That is probably not biological depression in the same way. That doesn't look the same to a psychiatrist um, as as a biological depression, which I would define as sort of a neuroinflammatory depression or something that's actually rooted in biochemistry in the body. So I think the mm -hmm. first thing is that we have to make the distinction between those. And I totally agree with you that. All of those get lumped together because what we do in psychiatry is we use these subjective, these subjective norms 
you know, the DSM-5 to say who's having depression. We don't actually right. have biological things, and I think that that's where the field is going. We're gonna have more biological markers, but we're using subjective norms or subjective um, bases to create a diagnosis of depression, and so I think a lot of people who just have exogenous depression, meaning depression because their life is hard, or you know, they, they see this image on Instagram or Facebook, or you know, some of, the, some of these other conditions are getting prescribed antidepressants, and I think this is a real disservice to those people because these are not yeah. benign medications. Um, and so, you know, this is not to take anything away from people who are in those situations. Life can get really hard, but I don't mm -hmm. believe that that is the time that we give someone an antidepressant. That is the time that people need support and therapy and community. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the biologic depression is what's really interesting to me because that's the kind of thing that I think is very linked to food and diet. And uh, that's what I'm seeing as well. And these are sometimes the more severe depression cases. Sometimes they're cases that don't respond well to antidepressants. Sometimes they're cases that do respond to antidepressants. But as you know, an antidepressant is not correcting the root cause. You right. know, the, as we are beginning to understand now in psychiatry, this old idea of the monoamine hypothesis, the idea that it's low serotonin in the synapse yeah. that's creating depression, is sort of going by the wayside. And we're starting to we're starting to realize it's much more complex than that. And mm -hmm. You know, the, the antidepressant medications may have mechanisms which do have anti-inflammatory roles in the brain, but they're not correcting the root cause. And, and one of the things that I think is so interesting to think about is that if we use anti-inflammatory medications in the body and we get rid of the inflammation in one place, it's going to manifest somewhere else. You have to right. extinguish this, the, the, the most fundamental fire in the body, you know. And that's why I don't like using antidepressants for people with biological depression until we at all, really, but you know, you definitely want to know where the inflammation is coming from. And we see this all over the place, and this is something I think I talked about with Mark Bell on his podcast as well, that people, I think, are overusing anti-inflammatory drugs, or there's this oversell in the pharmaceutical and the supplement industry of anti-inflammatory things, and it, this really bothers me. It's, you know, I think we ultimately have to ask, where is the inflammation coming from, and how do we get rid of that, rather than just taking you know, six gallons of turmeric extract every day. That's not the right way to do this. Nor, yeah. you know, and then we shouldn't be doing this with antidepressants either. So yeah, I definitely think that diet is linked to this, and we can talk about my views on that, but I, I do believe that anxiety is very similar, and anxiety can have the same sort of uh, paradigm, where there are People can get anxious if you know someone in your family is in trouble, but there are people who probably have a biological cause of anxiety, and these and these are things that we really need to look for the neuroinflammatory bases of, and we can treat it with therapy, and it'll help a little bit. But unless we address the biology, depression, anxiety, these are probably not going to get a whole lot better. You know, if we're, mm -hmm. we're fighting an uphill battle, if the brain is quote unquote on fire, if there's neuroinflammation and we don't correct it, it's not going to go anywhere. Right. I think there's a, a very small percentage of people who, you know, for whatever reason, uh, from a, say, a neurochemical perspective, um, are required to, you know, seek help and be on antidepressants if it's, you know, life dependent. But I think a lot of people feel the depression that comes with living life in general. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think you can speak to a single person, even someone who thinks they're the happiest person on the planet who hasn't at one point felt a little bit depressed, right? Like if you get rejected by a, uh, a, you know, a, a girl or a guy growing up or you don't get that job, um, you know, but there's there's ways of dealing with these depressed states that are, I think, um, you know, the, the correct way to approach it, uh, to grow from it. And I think um, depression, like you said, uh, it gets misconstrued and some oftentimes when you fail at something or you're feeling sad, uh, people just assume that it's some sort of depression that needs to be treated instantly yeah. rather than growing from it and figuring out, like, is it the way that I'm eating? Is it my lack exactly. of exercise? Is it this job that maybe I'm doing and it's not fulfilling, you know, what makes me happy at this moment? Um, and I think maybe you agree that once you get on antidepressants, it sort of creates this dependence. It does, I because agree. Because now... Now, um, you know, the, the reuptake of like, serotonin inhibitors um, is now there from a drug that you're administering every day. And so your body never really learns to, you know, produce its own serotonin um, or deal with it through diet and food and exercise. Yeah, I mean, the symptoms are actually so instructive. You know, uh, this is such an interesting idea that you bring up that if we are not feeling good in our lives, whether it's fatigue, whether it's a rash, whether it's abdominal pain, gas bloating, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, this is a really important signal not to ignore. You know, it's saying yeah. something is wrong. Like it's actually, it's quite a, um, it's quite a blessing in some ways, you know, or it's quite, it's quite valuable to look at that and say, 
oh, there's something wrong here. This is, I'm getting a signal from my body. There's a red light. This is the check engine light coming on in my car. Like, I don't just put a sticker over the check engine light, you know? Like, the check yeah. engine light is still on yeah. underneath the sticker on your car. Yeah. Like, that's what an SSRI is. It's a sticker over the check engine light. And it's very valuable to be like, oh, the check engine light is on. I'm going to take this to a mechanic, which I actually really think of myself as a human mechanic now. And I think that's the way that doc, that's, that's what medicine is. It's human mechanics. It's human, uh, you know, I'm a human engineer and I'm trying to understand how all the engine parts are working. And so mm-hmm. people need to, I, I would totally agree. I hope people will not ignore the symptoms and see them as a good thing. And, and you know, our job is to give people the ideas and say like, oh, if you're having this, maybe it's this, or you know, like they, people don't need to get overwhelmed. Uh, I think the fear when the symptom arises is how am I ever gonna fix this, right? And right. that's what that's what you, that's what I try and help people do, is mm-hmm. give them, you know, give them tools and information about what could be going wrong. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, and correct me again if I'm wrong, but you know, I've read warning labels on certain um, kinds of antidepressants that suggest you may be more prone to thoughts of suicide upon taking this medicine. And I've actually, I read one study, I wish I had it in front of me, that um, compared, you know, say a placebo to antidepressants, and they found that people who are on the antidepressants were more likely to have suicidal thoughts or feel um, depressed, which I think, again, should be a big warning label to people who um, are feeling sad or they feel that they may be in a depression to first figure out different avenues. Like, for example, when I when I hurt my knee, I went and saw a doctor, I went and saw a physiotherapist, and I went and saw a chiropractor. I think it's equally as important for anything you're going through in life, health-wise, to consult professionals of different fields to see what works for you and yeah. what might be the best alternative route for you, functionally speaking. Yeah, yeah. I think that people need to know that there's more than one answer out there. And like you said, that's what YouTube, that's what podcasts, that's what Instagram does. And I love that. I love that information can be shared this way because I think this is causing medicine to move in the right direction. But yeah, I mean, some people definitely become more suicidal. I've seen people have really bad reactions to SSRIs or or any antidepressant. There are also SNRIs and dopaminergic medications like bupropion. But um, yeah, I mean, they're not benign medications. We are tinkering with the neurotransmitters in our brains, and for mm-hmm. most people, they're fairly safe, quote unquote. You know, like mm-hmm. I, I don't, I wouldn't. They're not a vitamin. You know, not yeah. it's good for us. But yeah. most people, they're fine. But definitely, people have strong reactions to them, and they're not something to take lightly. I don't consider them to be benign medications at all. I don't think there's any pharmaceutical that's benign. You know, we need to be Mm -hmm. aware of what these molecules are doing. Right. And, you know, going back to the idea of uh, inflammation and anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, again, I I see way too many people, especially elderly people in their 40s and 50s, and I'd say like 8 or 9 out of 10 adults that I talk to are on some sort of anti-inflammatory medication for their joints or their back which honestly blows my mind because if I had to think about any time I felt inflamed, like say through my joints, when I first started uh, like doing CrossFit or, or Olympic weightlifting, I found that at the time my diet consisted of a lot of bread. I was eating way too much toast through the day. I was having three sandwiches a day with right. you know cold cuts and processed meat. Um, and <clears throat> that and all the refined stuff I was having I felt was having an impact on my joints. I thought that Absolutely. I needed to eat more carbs and more bread or whatever it might be to support the level of exercise that I was doing. But once I switched back to, you know, a keto or paleo kind of lifestyle and I cut out, you know, wheat and gluten and anything that was refined, I found that the inflammation in my joints went away like a hundred percent within two days. Within two days. So there were certain things that I couldn't do without excruciating pain, like a ring dip, you know, a ring dip is a very functional movement, but I couldn't do it without my elbows literally exploding with pain. I cut out the bread and I started to have more meat. I went back to my keto lifestyle mm-hmm. and within two days, it was all gone. It was all gone and I, I, it blew me away. It's because, so crazy. Yeah. It's so crazy. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, I totally agree with you. Like the food is so powerful and I wish, I hope that in the next decade, physicians will begin to in- to, to think about that, you know, whether it's mm-hmm. rheumatologists who are the people who are going to see people with arthritis, you know, and say like, well, why don't you work on your diet? You know, like let's take out some of the quote unquote inflammatory foods. And one of the things we can dig into is that we don't really know what foods are inflammatory and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the, one of the nuances and, you know, sort of the hypotheses surrounding what's cool about a carnivorous diet or an elimination diet or a ketogenic diet is we can tweak that. And they may be different for every person, but um, the idea 
the simple idea that a food can create an immunologic reaction in the body is pretty incredible and uh, paradigm shifting in, in what in medicine today, you know, I mean, we see it in terms of IgE anaphylactic reactions where people can eat like, I don't know, peanuts or something and they're having an IgE. But mostly what we're talking about with these food intolerances or these food sensitivities are IgA or IgG, usually it's IgG, one of the IgG subclasses, uh, creating some sort of immunologic reaction in the body that's subclinical. And so, you know, a, a traditionally trained allergist may not think about this, they're just thinking about the IgE anaphylactic things. But these foods, gluten is a great example, I mean, nuts, as we can talk about, are just very rich in um, anti-nutrients and potentially lectins and things like this, which contribute to the immune system. So Yeah. And so, you know, you hear a lot about um, the gut-brain axis mm -hmm. and how the impact of your gut health can reflect directly to how your brain is feeling or your mental health. Yeah. So how does that work and how does food tie into all of that? You know, the gut-brain axis is really is really interesting and, and uh, trending right now. And there's a couple of ways that it that it probably works. You know, the most direct way is through the vagus nerve, which is an actual nerve uh, that's visible um, in the human body during surgery or whatever. And it runs, it, it innervates the majority of the gut, and it runs straight, you know, into your brain. And so, neurologically, your body can sense how the gut is is is, is happening. You know, there's a guy, there's a researcher named John Cryan, and he's he kind of says, you know, what happens in Vegas, the V-A-G-U-S nerve doesn't stay in Vegas. It goes up to the yeah. brain, you know. So yeah. that's the first way, you know, that, that it's just kind of this overall sensing of the gut um, with the vagus nerve. And perhaps that's the mechanism, I don't think we fully understand, but perhaps that's the mechanism by which anxiety or uh, extreme stress that we perceive in our brain can be transmitted to the gut, you know, in like a, you know, to, uh, top down but then there can also be, you know, bottom up signals coming from the gut and going to the brain and changing the way things are happening. At a more microscopic level, I would say the immune system is the way that that happens. And the immune system is all of these cells, both of the innate and adaptive immune systems that are concentrated immediately proximal, immediately next to the one cell layer thick um, uh, epithelium in the gut. So inside of the gut, whether it's the small intestine or the large intestine, there's and mostly in the small intestine, there are the lumen of the gut is where all the food is, and there are you know trillions of bacteria, and then there's one cell layer, and then there's the lamina propria, which is where most of uh, our immune system actually lives. And so there are, you know, we're teeming with immune cells, which are constantly sampling and interacting with the environment in the gut. And so there's all this discussion now, and I think it gets to be pretty complex, and we don't fully understand it. But the basic fifteen thousand foot perspective is that. The way that antigens from the gut, that would be food molecules, um, are interacting with our immune system and or bacteria in the gut are interacting with our immune system immediately proximal to the lamina propria in the gut. And so that, and then the thing about the immune system is that it doesn't just stay in the gut. It starts there and then it can get activated and move. And so there's this, there's this immediate crosstalk, this immediate flow of the immune system around the gut and then through the rest of the body, you know. Um, if you listen to some of Alessio Fasano's lectures, who's uh, one of these pediatric gastroenterologists at MGH in Boston connected with Harvard, he talks about this idea that you can look at immune cells and tell where they originated. And so what you find in type 1 diabetes is that there are immunologic cells in the pancreas having an, an autoimmune reaction against the pancreas, but they have markers saying that they originated in the gut. So this right. is wild. And you see that throughout the body. Yeah. The same thing happens in multiple sclerosis. You see immune cells in the brain which have markers which suggest that they originate in the gut. So there, wow. there is, there's this idea that there's this immunologic reaction that probably starts in the gut and, um, and then can go to the whole body. And everybody's going to manifest it differently in terms of how they have this immunologic reaction. And that is really kind of the idea of autoimmunity or one of the hypotheses which is strongly supported by, I would say, evidence right now that immune cells surrounding the gut are triggered by something, whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a dysbiosis, which is the wrong type of bacteria living in the gut, whether it's mm -hmm. food antigens, whether it's a combination of all those three, and then they get triggered and they go somewhere else in the body and they happen to react against that part of the body based on our own individual genetics and that gets into things like um, you know, multiple histocompatibility complexes and the way that all of us look individually to our immune system, it's pretty complex. Right. And that's it's it's really interesting. I mean, first of all, to accept that there's live bacterial culture in your gut, but also, you know, the health of that bacteria that's living in your gut 
and it's you know whatever its relationship with your gut health at the time can affect how you feel physically or in the brain um and i know you're a big uh, carnivore yeah. advocate um, i know that you eat a carnivore diet I do. and I, i've seen a lot of people um i know you mentioned sean baker when you were discussing with mark bell but i've seen a lot of really interesting stories um you know i've been eating closer to to carnivore recently mm-hmm. um and that's more more or less had to do with just my schedule and how busy i was so mm-hmm. for me to get full and stay satisfied for long periods of time and not have to think about food and eating i, I typically wouldn't be able to do that on oatmeal and, and a bagel right like i would be hungry within two hours but right. for me to have you know a 16 ounce prime burger with just a slice of cheese on it at lunch it'll tide me over for at least six hours. Um, so I find that I'm able to, to go longer periods of time and I do it more for the health. I mean, it's great to stay lean, uh, but just for the way that I feel, my ability to dial in mentally, to focus on tasks without um, without feeling the crash in my brain or yeah. just, just feeling sluggish in the afternoons. Um, it's been great. And, and I have a little bit of a carnivore twist on it where if I need to, you know, I'll, I'll have you know some almonds here and there um, or I'll have eggs and, and some bacon in the morning, but essentially, you know, my primary source of fuel now is either steak or beef. Uh, and I feel really, really good. And I've heard stories like Michaela Peterson, where she had, you know, such bad pain to the point where she had to have multiple surgeries and it was excruciating and having beef, salt, and water completely cured her symptoms. Um, so I just want you to go a little bit into the carnivore diet, uh, the misconceptions of it. Um, you know, if there are any potential quote unquote dangers to it, how it affects, you know, yeah. things like cholesterol and heart disease and all that. I'd really love to dive into that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think Michaela Peterson had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which is quite a debilitating, um, autoimmune condition. So that is a condition that we don't really solve well in Western medicine. And so it's quite striking that, that she was able to have that much improvement on it. And, and I think she's a great example. And if you look at, you know, one of the websites that Sean maintains is meat, meatheals.com. There mm-hmm. are literally hundreds of stories of people and it's indexed by condition. You know, the, one of the biggest entries is mental health stuff, but there, there's by gut stuff, there's by skin, there's all sorts of autoimmune conditions and people will write in just sort of like user crowdsourcing, like what they right. experienced on it. So uh, when I first heard about the carnivore diet, I've been strict carnivore for four months now. Um, I thought it was crazy. And I think that if, if people are listening to this and they think a carnivore diet, that is crazy. I, you know, I thought the same thing. So don't, that's totally fine. Like it, it's just so counterintuitive yep. based on what we've been told our whole lives. Mm-hmm. And so, but the more I went into it and the more I researched it and I listened to Jordan Peterson's story and I, uh, listened to the stuff that Sean Baker was talking about and I read about stuff on meatheels.com and it was just so striking to me because Kind of like I was saying earlier, one of the things that's been most fascinating to me, perhaps the most interesting thing for me in medicine is when we can affect the root cause of something. And, and that's what I've always wanted to understand in medicine is what is causing this chronic disease. And, you know, autoimmune disease, my perspective after having gone through medical school and residency is that autoimmunity, the immune system is probably at the root of the majority of the illness that we see. And that is a pretty radical statement. I would definitely say that autoimmunity is behind a lot of these neuroinflammatory mental health things. I mean, within psychiatry, not many people are going to say that. Like, but I believe a lot of psychiatric right. diseases are autoimmune. And I would believe a lot of diseases that we're seeing are autoimmune. And there are many that are considered to be autoimmune by the popular uh, medical community. This would be like inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can think of something like eczema, psoriasis. These are autoimmune. All of the traditional rheumatologic conditions, you know, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, lupus, Sjogren's, scleroderma. These are all autoimmune. I mean, most things are autoimmune. And if you expand and you actually conceptualize heart disease or atherosclerotic vascular disease, you know, the immune system is involved there and there's potential that's also autoimmune. And so we're looking mm-hmm. at like, well, so mental health represents the greatest burden to our society right now. So loss of uh, health and wellness and productivity is the greatest from depression and anxiety now. It exceeds uh, cardiovascular disease and cancer now. But if you look at uh, mental health being uh, widely autoimmune, cardiovascular disease being autoimmune, you have now you have the majority of what we experience as humans is autoimmune. So anything that could yeah. address or potentially leverage autoimmunity piques my attention immediately. So when I heard these stories, I thought that I need to look more into that. And the more I delved into it, uh, you know, the more I the more I became interested. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And so um, I started doing it. And 
my experience, I talked about this on my YouTube channel, um, and I'll probably do some more videos about it, but within days, within days, I felt a noticeable difference in terms of my mood, and I did not believe that I had depression or anxiety before, but I was more upbeat and more emotionally resilient. It was like, I didn't even understand the fact that I had a little bit of a clout, you know? It was like, it was like you have your glasses on and then you, somebody takes them off you and says, oh man, these are all dusty and you, you wipe them off, you're like, oh my God, like I can see way better now. And so yeah. within days that happened. Um, and then that's really been maintained throughout the period. And interestingly, as I have talked about before, the first week that I did carnivore, I did not do keto. So I did, I did honey with it. I was kind of doing an experiment and I wanted to know yeah. like, is this ketosis or is this carnivore? And I felt the benefits without doing ketogenesis, without being in ketosis. And then I stopped doing the honey because I was like, you know what, I just, I wanna stop the honey. Uh, but that was part of my transition was using the honey. And you know, I've been, I've been strictly carnivore since then and I've gone through different you know, permutations of how I do it. But I've continued to feel really good uh, emotionally and physically um, and uh, yeah, I can go into all that kind of stuff. But I've also done, people will see on my Instagram, and I'll do more of this on my YouTube channel, that I've done a shitload, I don't know if I can curse, but I've done a heck of a lot of um, blood work on myself because I have access to it as a physician, and one of the things in the space that I've realized is that there's not enough, um, there's not enough being done to uh, substantiate the claims that are being made or to even address the safety concerns around the carnivorous diet. So. Right. You brought up a lot of them. So when people hear carnivorous diet, they think a couple of things. I think the main thing they think is, isn't that going to like make your heart explode? How can you eat all that red meat? Hundred right? percent. Right. And so this is this is kind of the thing that it's we get into the weeds here, and it's really hard. And this is one of the things that I lament about the way that our society presents medical information to the consumer. You really have to almost be a physician to be able to wade through these studies, or to have the time, or the interest, or the, the knowledge, I mean, I think there are plenty of people who are not physicians who are smart enough and have enough education in terms of reading studies to do this, but it's pretty rare, you know? And so I think the consumer is just trying to make heads or tails of all this, and it's very difficult. But there's just been so much badly uh, communicated information about red meat. And mm-hmm. there, is, there is no intervention trial that exists on the face of the earth with red meat to show that it is bad for humans. Mm-hmm. Every study that has been done vilifying red meat is an associational epidemiology study, which is, in my view, you know, you know, inescapably uh, invalid because of healthy user bias. So what are we looking at here? So we're looking at probably 20 to 25 studies that have been done in the last 30 years where people have been given food frequency questionnaires and they say, they'll say, what do you eat? And then they'll, they'll check back in with those people five or 10 years later. What did you eat over the last five to 10 years? And then they'll look at their health outcomes. There's a great video on YouTube right now um, from Ivor Cummins, and he's addressing a, a recent study which showed or suggested that low carb dieting was associated with poor health outcomes. Yeah. And the Shorten idea. your lifespan. Yeah. This is crazy, yeah. right? And so what we're doing here is we're doing epidemiology. There's no studies. There's never been a study. I think it's just important for people to realize there's never been a study where they took two groups of people. And one group of people, they fed red meat, and one group of people, they didn't feed red meat, and then they said, oh, the group of people eating red meat gets heart disease. That never happens. That doesn't exist because that's, that study's been done. It's evolution, and it didn't happen. You know, there are so many confounding things. Yeah. But what has been done over the years repeatedly is they say, what did you eat? What do you eat now? And they look back, um, and then they, they go forward and see how people do. Well, the problem is that in the 1960s and the 1970s, red meat was widely vilified, and the healthy user bias is the idea that anyone who ate red meat in those periods also probably did other bad life behaviors. They didn't get out in the sun as much. They're probably vitamin D deficient. They may be more likely to smoke. And if you look at the studies, this is generally what we see. If you look at the subgroup analyses, the people who eat meat have a higher rate of diabetes. They have a higher rate of smoking. They have more obesity. Well, okay, of course they're going to have worse outcomes, you know, because it's yeah. not in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of many people in this field, it is not the meat, it's what you're eating with the meat, right? Mm-hmm. So somebody goes and they eat hamburgers for 10 years. What are they likely to eat with hamburgers? French fries, white buns, you know, and you know, maybe a churro or a donut afterwards. So yeah. it's just, this has never been done. So there is no evidence that red meat causes heart disease. Yep. And this also gets misconstrued in the idea around lipids. And this is a really deep rabbit hole, but the idea is that if we are talking about cholesterol, this is one thing that is also widely misunderstood in the general populace. Yeah. So um, I was, I mentioned earlier, I was a PA in cardiology, so I have a, a good amount of knowledge of lipids and I'm, I'm versed in this field. I'm not a cardiologist now, but I feel like I can speak 
reasonably uh, respectively about lipids. So the problem here is that when we consume more saturated fat, our LDL number goes up. Now, is this a problem? I would say strongly no. This is not the best predictor of heart disease. And again, this has been showed by, Ivor Cummins has a great video about this on YouTube. If you look at the LDL numbers of people who have heart attacks, there is no correlation. People with high LDL have the same number of heart attacks as the people with low LDL. Clearly there's right. something else going on. That is not a good metric. And if you look at Framingham, uh, which is a large study from Massachusetts, subgroup analyses, we can see the same thing. LDL is a very, very poor predictor of heart disease. There are better ones out there. There are, there are we can stratify all the predictors of heart disease. LDL, HDL ratio, LDL, non-HDL, looking at triglycerides, looking at oxidized LDL, looking at LDL particle size. But generally what we see with all the metrics that correlate with heart disease incidents, they are directly tied to insulin resistance, which is the precursor or sort of pseudo synonym of diabetes or prediabetes. So what we are looking at is insulin resistance is atherogenic. Insulin resistance is the spark that lights the fire. It is not, you know, it is not LDL. LD is not, LDL is not atherogenic in and of itself. Now I'll just dig into it a little more so people can understand. So LDL yeah, is a particle, do. it's a balloon. And it's a lipoprotein particle, so it has lipids in the membrane, and it has uh, proteins in the membrane, and it travels around the body transporting cholesterol and triglycerides. It has, an, it has a very important thing that it does. It has a normal right. role. Having no LDL is a really bad thing. We would not be alive, right? We need LDL, just like we need HDL. And you can, in a very oversimplified model, you can imagine LDL going out of the liver. It starts out as a precursor particle to LDL called VLDL, yeah. but it could VLDL, then it becomes LDL and then it goes out to the tissues, and then maybe it goes back to the liver as an HDL particle. So that's maybe, so there's multiple like buses running around. Yeah. Well, the cholesterol and the triglycerides in the LDL balloon can become oxidized, and in that case, it becomes atherogenic, because in that case, it seems to be much more likely to go into the uh, subendothelial space, which is where the immune system resides, and to be taken up by a macrophage, and that's the beginning of a fatty streak, which is a precursor to an atherosclerotic plaque in the vessel, but it has to go into the subendothelial space in the vessel. So if we look at the actual space between endothelial cells, it's like 70 nanometers, or maybe 70 angstroms. No, I think it's 70 nanometers. And so the LDL particles range in size from 19 to 23 nanometers. So they're, they're small enough that they're always gonna fit in there, but the rate at which they go in is probably dependent on how many LDL particles there are. Mm -hmm. But if they go in and they come out and they don't get oxidized, it's probably not a problem. And this is what, generally what we see is that um, People who have high LDL without markers of inflammation, and we can talk about what those are, or without markers of insulin resistance, don't have the same result of that high LDL as somebody that may have high LDL with insulin resistance. Right. So there are really two things that can happen. There are multiple states that you can get to to have high LDL. The majority of people in westernized society, sadly, get to a high LDL via the road of insulin resistance. Right. Mm -hmm. So when, that, when those two are together, this is like dry wood and a spark. The dry wood is LDL. You can have a whole bunch of dry wood around, but if there's no spark, if there's no inflammation, it's not gonna start a fire. Right. The spark is insulin resistance. The spark is the problem. And so you can have a ton of dry wood, you can have a high LDL, and it's not gonna create atherosclerosis without a spark. But most people, the other mechanism by which we can get to a bunch of LDL is through the insulin resistance mechanism. So the spark is already there. But when people eat carnivore, a lot of times when people eat keto, the LDL goes through the roof, and primary care doctors get really worried and this is not something that's a problem. It's just not, an, it's not the same phenotype, it's not the same issue as the insulin resistance LDL phenotype. So, there's no evidence linking red meat directly to heart disease, and when we eat a lot of saturated fat, there's also really very, there's no evidence linking saturated fat to heart disease, and the LDL model is very poor, it's insulin resistance. Well, what, what happens with keto or carnivore to insulin resistance? It goes down. There's almost, I mean, these are the most insulin sensitive people on the planet, you know? Yeah. So, you know, my, my fasting insulin is 3.0, which is below the normal range. It's so low. Fasting insulin is one of the measures that we can use to say that someone is insulin resistant. And the higher the fasting insulin, the more insulin resistant someone is, generally speaking. So mm -hmm. a fasting insulin below four is really good. And I see fasting insulins all over the place, but if people haven't checked their fasting insulin, that would be a great measure of insulin resistance in conjunction with things like hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, et cetera, et cetera. So right. high LDL without insulin resistance is not the same as high LDL with insulin resistance, but people get really worried about it because nobody wants to have a heart attack. Yeah, people get worried because, like you said, cholesterol is vilified as a word. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever you hear the word cholesterol, people shriek. 
right? They don't want to have high cholesterol. They don't want to have cholesterol at all. So you see, you know, eggs or whatever it may be being advertised as low cholesterol. Um, people are afraid to eat yolk, which has an insane amount of micronutrients. Right. I mean, it's a precursor for life at the end of the day. Right. Um, it's one of the best sources of nutrients, in my opinion, especially to start your day. Uh, and people are avoiding it. I mean, they'd rather have a bowl of cereal that's advertised as healthy and low in cholesterol than to have this egg, which honestly blows my mind. And I think, again, because cholesterol has been tied into red meat for whatever reason, um, I think, quite frankly, the reason that you mentioned, because red meat is always in North America attached to a bun um, or yeah. eaten with fries or a Coca-Cola. Catch up with just I full think sugar. It, it's just been absolutely, like it's been 40 or 50 years of of blaming saturated fat. Um, and I, I heard a really good quote. It's like, don't blame the butter for what the bread did. Yeah. Um, and it's true. I mean, people hear cholesterol and they get extremely worried, not understanding that cholesterol is extremely important in your body. I mean, it's in every single lipid membrane you have. Yes. Um, it's a precursor for steroid hormones, mm -hmm. including testosterone. testosterone so yeah. you, you need cholesterol. I mean, um, it, it won't kill you. Right. It will definitely not kill you. You know, it can become oxidized, but it will not yeah. kill you. And it's the, you want to prevent the oxidation of cholesterol. And you can look at how much cholesterol is oxidized, you know, but you cannot just look at how many of the balloons are in your body full of cholesterol. So that's the other thing that I didn't really say that we can perhaps clarify is that cholesterol technically is a steroid molecule, has a steroid backbone. Triglycerides are three fatty acids with a glycerol head. So triglycerides are a type of fat. Cholesterol is not technically a fat. It's a steroid mm -hmm. molecule. But both triglycerides yeah. and cholesterol are packaged into an LDL molecule, which is a lipoprotein, just like HDL or VLDL or a chylomicron. And so when we say cholesterol with quotes, we're usually talking about LDL, HDL, you know, and it gets, the, the wording is very unfortunate. So people get quite confused. But there are also studies that show that a high cholesterol later in life is protective. And this is probably because we need the precursors. We need the steroid yeah. hormones. And Absolutely. you know, one of the things you see is that if you push the cholesterol too far down, there are studies that suggest you can have increased suicidality as well. You know, we mm -hmm. see this with statins, you know, and, and the problem with yeah. statin is that it, it inhibits HMG CoA reductase, which is an enzyme that makes the cholesterol backbone. But there are many yeah. other steroid molecules that are also produced by that enzyme that are inhibited, like coenzyme Q10, among others, many others. So we inhibit the enzyme. It doesn't just stop making cholesterol, which we need, as you said, for our yeah. cell membranes. We need this for life. It inhibits other molecules too. So um, those statins have uh, robust evidence in secondary prevention, that is in people who have had heart attacks, the effect size is pretty small compared to things like dietary interventions. You know, there's this mm -hmm. crazy idea that um, there was a study in the late 90s, I believe, called the Diet Leon study, which was the Mediterranean diet, which is not something I necessarily am super excited about. But regardless, there have been dietary intervention studies like Diet Leon, which showed a much greater absolute risk reduction than a statin. But it's, I mean, you know, and then it gets into this nuance around absolute risk reduction, relative risk reduction, and the statistics get blurry. But the absolute risk reduction in Diet Leon is greater than the absolute risk reduction in statin trials. But we don't think about that. Everybody gets a statin because it's something that we can do yeah. and it's, it's a sure thing. You know, you can put a pill in your mouth, but your doctor cannot, your doctor cannot assure that you are going to uh, make a dietary change. Um, yeah. Yeah. And in this generation, it's really tough to get people <clears throat> to be pushed towards something that takes longer but works effectively. Because it's all about instant gratification, right? And that goes back to the conversation we were having earlier. It's extremely hard to tell people, like, you're going to have to put in, like, even a small amount of work most people are not willing to do. It's like, okay, just throw away the bun when you eat your burger. It's like, no, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want this to taste the way I want it to taste, and I want to get better. So it's like, it's a tough balance, right? Um, yeah. A lot of, you know, you, you have to rely heavily on people caring about themselves, and you have to rely on your ability to get rid of these preconceived notions of what meat can do to you and you know you can you can talk about again all, all the political things like kellogg's you know pushing oh their agenda <laughs> in, in the early 20th century yes. uh the industrialization of wheat um you know in the 1960s the, the time article that got published recently about um, harvard scientists being paid off by the american sugar association to publish false data about uh, saturated fat and blaming that as the the main culprit Crazy. which led to 50 years i mean even now you still see it yeah in in late in food labels right it's it has a check mark by the american heart association and it's on a bowl of honey nut cheerios 
Well, just because there's a friendly bee on it and it's made from whole wheat or whatever it might be, it doesn't mean it's going to help your heart. It doesn't. Right? So, so that agenda hasn't ended. I mean, it's, it's being pushed by so much money that it's really, really, really hard to fight back with. And I think that the thing, I think somebody realized 50 years ago that it was going to be much easier to sell people <laughs> on the idea that fat makes you fat or that fat makes you have a heart attack because because right, it's in the word it, it, it's in the word and it looks like it looks like it and you know if you've i mean people probably have not seen this but if they if you do a carotid endarterectomy on someone and you cut open the carotid artery which is the artery in the neck surgeons will go in and scoop out plaque right plaque looks like scrambled eggs and so i've yeah. actually heard surgeons say like don't eat eggs cuz i've scooped that oh, out of somebody's my arteries God. right this is not the same thing, but I think that it's a very easy sell to, to people, and I think it's a real injustice. This is not the same thing. Like, and I've heard Joel Kahn say this, and on, you know, on the podcast with Joe Rogan and Chris Kresser, like he said, I have scooped fat out and cholesterol out of people's arteries, and it's like, no, you're misleading people. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Yes, there is cholesterol in the plaque. No dietary cholesterol will not contribute to that in the absence of other factors that are promoting insulin resistance and inflammation. And that's, that's what's so hard to unravel is people don't know what to believe and there's so much propaganda. And you know, all somebody has to say is, I scooped plaque out of somebody's artery and it looks like fat. And they say, wow, I should never eat fat, which is really, I mean, it makes sense intuitively, but it's completely wrong. And so yeah, I think that you know, I would encourage people just to like take a step back and think about things evolutionarily and think, what have we eaten for 500,000 years as humans? What would our ancestors eat if first and foremost? They're going to kill an animal. They're going to eat the animal. They're going to eat every piece of the animal. There's no way they're not going to eat the fat. They're not going to eat lean meat. I hate this idea around political correctness and lean meat. You know, Even the functional medicine docs you know, are saying eat lean meat. And I, th What are you talking about? Eat fatty meat. Eat the most fat you yeah. possibly can. Like, get the fattiest meat. That's the meat that our ancestors would eat. Like, There is yeah. no evidence that saturated fat or meat fat contributes to atherosclerosis. This is just yeah. false. But the, the pundits, you know, these, these widely known functional medicine doctors are still saying that, like still eat lean meat. And I'm like, what are you crazy? Eat the fat. Like yeah. eat, eat as much fat as you can. That's what your ancestors would have done. And I just do not believe, <laughs> though this is an appeal to more of a theoretical mechanism, I do not believe that from an evolutionary basis we would have been eating something that was bad for us or that something that is bad for us would have been would have created the species that continued. Our bodies would have evolved mechanisms around them. There is there is yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me just, you know, intuitively that red meat would be bad for us. And and this is we've been eating this for 500,000 years. It was a sta yeah. it's a staple. Yeah, and you know, every single talk I've given locally, you know, it, it's tough because people have their beliefs. You know, it's a belief system that's been built over time, which I understand. But one of the first things I say, which kind of gets either some laughs or some, you know, epiphanies, I can see it in people's faces. Like, well, if you're walking around the forest hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years ago, would you come across a bowl of pasta or would you come across wild meat? You know, what would your ancestors mo most likely have eaten? And if you understand how long it takes for genetic mutations to take place in humans and how how short our, our, our history is relative to, you know, our history on Earth as like microorganisms, you know, evolving into what we are now. Yeah. Like there hasn't been a whole lot of time that's passed relative to the history of Earth for humans to really, you know, adapt and now, now be like really good at eating cereal and using it for fuel. I mean, you can see it. You can just visually see how many obese people live in North America, the type 2 diabetes rates that are on the rise, the fact that heart disease is... I believe the number one or number two killer of men in North America, which is outrageous because it's probably the most preventable. It's highly um, preventable. You know, right. And, and so it, it, it really, um, it, it's tough. It's tough. And I can imagine it would be even more tough if you're in functional medicine, because now you have to convince people, uh, of one thing and they've been hearing different opinions their whole lives. And I understand. I mean, when I first started dabbling with the keto diet, I was in my first year of university and up to that point I played a lot of sports so I could get away with eating oatmeal for breakfast, I could have toast for lunch, I could have rice with chicken for dinner and I was fine. I was fairly lean, I felt good, no inflammation um, and then I started university and I wanted, at the time I was on, on the way to becoming a dentist and I've told this story a dozen times so I won't go that far into it but basically I stopped exercising and I just ate what I used to eat and actually led to me eating a lot more food calorically and a lot worse food because I just had to get through the day. So I found myself like extremely overweight relative to where I was before, probably 40 pounds in like 
three or four months. Mm -hmm. First of all, that going back to the idea of depression, I felt depressed because right. it wasn't what my body felt mo like optimal. It, I didn't feel natural. It didn't feel like who I was. And so that it was around the time that I started um, experimenting with the keto diet. And it was, it was so weird for me to have eggs with coconut oil on my, on my first day of, of trying this keto diet. And I uh, honestly, even myself, I, I couldn't believe I'm like, there's no way. But like a part of me said, you know what? It, it makes sense, right? So why not give it a try? And then within days, I never felt better. And I honestly have never looked back. And I've been able to help so many people since then, which is why my path changed in my career. Um, because awesome. I, it sparked this passion where I started helping family, friends, coworkers. Um, you know, one of our, my big success stories on our website is uh, one of my managers that I worked with. And, and he was 35 at the time. He'd gone through a lifetime of having... 40 pounds of weight that he could never lose. Right. No matter how much he restricted calories, restricted, you know, say carbohydrates, but still had them in his diet, he couldn't get rid of them. And, it, and that was a turning point. And so um, even though I'm big on keto, uh, I'm mostly just big on removing refined carbs and sugars and having more meat in your diet. I think that is a revelation for people. I think keto is a good place to start because you can take a step back and go, whoa, like those were the foods that were causing my body to feel absolutely horrible, right? And so mm -hmm. um, I think using keto is a, is a good way. It's a good method because it's it's more, you know, systematic where you, you get to understand what net carbs are and what meat is um, and how it can help you. Um, and, and then really see like, wow, my body was not reacting well to a high carb diet. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. I mean, I think a lot of people have the same reaction. You know, um, they say this steak with fat on it cannot be good for me, and, and I would just challenge them to think like, why do you think that? You know, like, yeah. is there a single study? Is there any science? No, it's coming from brainwashing. It's nothing short of yeah. brainwashing. And so I think we just need to think about things just very objectively and think like, okay. What if, what, if, what if this isn't the case? What if what I've been told is wrong, you know? Like, what if everything you've been yeah. told about nutrition is wrong? Because I really believe that, like, everything we've been told about nutrition is wrong. And I continue, every, it's, every day I have new revelations about that. Oh, that was completely wrong. You know, whether it's saturated fat, whether it's red meat, whether, you know, it's just, it's all wrong. Yeah, <laughs> it's and I, I really want to, I, um, I was talking to Mitch here about our next video. We should do the new uh, food guidelines because I don't know if you heard Canada recreated its food guideline no. and you know how they, they do a, they show you the plate right. and how much of each food you should have. It'll blow your mind. I mean, most of it is suggesting some sort of wheat, whether it's whole wheat or rice uh -huh. or potato or whatever it might uh -huh. be. Um, if you had to guess how much red meat Canada suggests for the average person to eat a day in grams, what would you guess? Well, there was this thing that came out in the U.S. recently with the eight, Eat Lancet guidelines, and it was eight grams a day. <laughs> exactly. Four, 14 grams for Canada. <laughs> 14, and I believe like... it's based off the Eat Lancet. Four, it, they showed 14 grams of meat in the photo, and it, it literally, I couldn't even recognize it as meat because it was so small. It's like the size of a bean. Or exactly. like, like the size of a large, you know, like, yeah. like a thumb or something. Yeah, yeah. 15 grams is one tablespoon of peanut butter. For anyone listening that needs a reference point, it's extremely, extremely small. That's just so tragic. I mean, um, yeah, I think that uh, plant-based diets, uh, I mean, it's just, you know, that amount of plants is, I think, going to cause real problems for people. And, you know, we can talk about why I think that is, but, you know, that... You know, I, I believe yeah. strongly and I think that there's strong evidence that, you know, meat and especially red meat is the most nutrient dense food on the planet. Uh, there are no anti nutrients in yeah. meat. So, you know, an animal, if you think about it evolutionarily, returning to this concept, which I think is quite instructive, animals yeah. move away when the animal, it's hard to catch a squirrel or a deer or <laughs> whatever. You know, those things, those things, they have antlers, yeah. you know, yeah. like they run away from you. They're skittish. They have better senses than we do. You know, they're, they're not going to. Yeah. Try and catch a cougar. Good luck, you know? The, yeah. it, and, you know, <clears throat> animals have not evolved anti-nutrients, quote-unquote, in their meat. They have not evolved defense mechanisms in their meat because they have defense mechanisms in who they are. If we look at plants, there's this really great paper that um, I will point out to people. And it's, it's published in uh, – it's quite an old paper, but it's really interesting. So um, it's uh, – let me find it for you. Here it is. Yep, yeah, no um, so it's 1990. It's from Bruce Ames, which is actually the the, the researcher that Rhonda Patrick used to work with. I think during her postdoctoral or doctoral wow. work, 
Yeah. So the paper is called Dietary Pesticides, 99.99% all natural. And it's a really scary review for anyone that believes plants are good or believes plants are entirely good or believes that kale is good for you or that kale loves you yeah. or that <laughs> believes this fairy tale <laughs> that, that plants are on the earth to feed humans, which is patently false. Plants are on the earth to survive, just like humans are on the earth to survive. But plants cannot run away from humans. And so yeah. plants have very intelligently evolved thousands and thousands of pesticides in the plants. And there's on, on the second page of this paper, table one, there's 49 natural pesticides and metabolites found in cabbage. 49 pesticides and metabolites found in cabbage. 49 in cabbage alone. Uh, these are natural. These are not added. So the um, people, I, I just will clarify, this is not Roundup. This is not glyphosate, which is the same. This is not 2,4-D. These are naturally occurring pesticides in cabbage. And we think like, okay, do we really think this is good for us? Like, uh, there's an argument to be made on the other side. Like, yes, you can make arguments that cabbage is beneficial, but I would make strong arguments to the reverse. And we really have to entertain these discussions. Though. So, for instance... 49, there's glucosinolates, there's indole glucosinolates, there's isothiocyanates, there are cyanides, there are terpenes, and there are phenols. These are all pesticides and metabolites found in cabbage. Now, isothiocyanates are one of the darlings of the uh, plant-based industry, and I know Rhonda Patrick, whose work I respect greatly, but um, she is all about sulforaphane, which is an isothiocyanate. So uh, there are there are probably 12 isothiocyanates listed here in cabbage. So any of the brassica vegetables is going to have an isothiocyanate. That's what it's one of the characteristics. Now, people need to know these are not these are not just like plant vitamins. This is not like kale taking its vitamins and you're getting like kale vitamins. These are pesticides. These are toxic chemicals yeah. that the plant has evolved to kill animals, to prevent them from eating them to the point of, you know, wiping out the species. And so right. People will say about sulforaphane, like, uh, sulforaphane is crazy. Like, people will say, oh, it reduces DNA damage. Well, you know, it, it has <laughs> been shown in some individuals to reduce 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, uh, which is one of the markers we use for DNA damage. But at what cost? And this gets into like a whole rabbit hole about how some of these chemical chemicals work. Because if you are looking at broccoli sprouts, for instance, or a brassica vegetable, you are getting sulforaphane. And sulforaphane may work to decrease DNA damage, but how does it do that? It, it does that by acting as a toxin, and so this gets into the whole debate about hormesis and whether a small amount of a toxin can be good for us. But it's also carrying with it all of these other pesticides. You can't separate out sulforaphane from the other probably 50 to 60 pesticides that are also in broccoli sprouts, right? And so the question is, how can anyone say with as much confidence as these people are trying to say that the net benefit of broccoli sprouts, cabbage, any brassica vegetable is positive? Or I should say the net, the net result of these is positive. There are, there are cyanides, there are terpenes, there are phenols. And so the idea is there are other compounds in there that could be very dangerous for us. And we know that isothiocyanates, even though they may increase glutathione, we can talk about that more in a second, they are also inhibiting the absorption of iodine. So if you eat enough kale or broccoli or cauliflower or Brussels sprouts, or cabbage, or collard greens. You can deplete the iodine to the point that you become hypothyroid. You know, so this is just one of the toxic mechanisms of these plants. Like, and there's nothing like that in animals. Animals are, they have no defense mechanisms. Plants have hundreds, and we don't even know what all these are doing in humans. It's incredible. Like, there, there are tons of these things. So if we just go into the, the, the glutathione thing a little bit, this gets quite complex, but glutathione is the major antioxidant in the body. It's a three amino acid peptide, and it's made in response to oxidative stress. Well, your body makes a, a baseline level of it. Your body always has some oxidative stress because of normal cellular respiration. There are free radicals produced in the mitochondria. Free radicals are molecules with an unpaired electron. And the goal or the, the function of glutathione is to be an electron donor. Uh, oxidation and reduction are just transit of electrons. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. So glutathione becomes oxidized by losing an electron, donating it to a free radical molecule, and thereby it takes a, a free electron, a uh, free radical molecule, which can be um, an initiator of oxidation reactions in the body, whether it's in DNA or lipids or any of these other things. It takes it out, right. of, out of circulation. So glutathione takes the hit, it takes it out of circulation. So generally we want to have more glutathione. 
But what we know is that, you know, there are um, many things which increase glutathione, which we would not say are good for humans. There are studies that I can show that uh, suggest or that show that smoking also increases glutathione. So the question is, yeah. at what point does something stop being good for us and start being a toxin? And I think with smoking, we could say, oh, there is no threshold. It is a toxin from the beginning. And we just don't know this about these plants. People can easily overconsume sulforaphane. We don't know how much of it is good for us. We don't know if any of it is good for us. And as a baseline, I would say, the metric that's generally been used is DNA damage. Well, where is the DNA damage coming from in the first place? And my hypothesis, what I would posit is that much of the DNA damage we may be seeing is probably coming from other plant compounds, right? So it's a little bit circular to say, oh, sulforaphane is gonna decrease the DNA damage. Well, where did the DNA damage come from in the first place? Yes, it could have come from uh, diesel exhaust or cellular respiration, but it can also, I think it's important for people to know that it can also come from some of these plant compounds. Are there examples of that? There are. This is what we call chemotherapy. Yeah. So one of the things, one of the, <laughs> there are multiple um, mechanisms by which chemotherapeutic agents are used to kill cancer. One of the major mechanisms of chemotherapeutic drugs is to induce DNA damage. Where are chemotherapy drugs found? Plants. That's where we get most of the chemotherapy drugs from. So like, if you look at the der derivation of chemotherapy drugs, they are found in plants. We get all of our chemotherapy, not all of them. The majority of our chemotherapy drugs come from plants. Right. So I don't want people to be confused here. We are not killing just the cancer. We are killing the human. Chemotherapy right. is poison. And mm -hmm. how does it work? It, there are multiple mechanisms for chemotherapy. One of the major mechanisms is by initiating DNA damage, whether it's by uh, creating guanosine or guanine adducts <laughs> or anything. So there are compounds in plants which create DNA damage, and they are called chemotherapy, and they will kill you. And I think people need to know that like plants are not all good. I, I just it drives me crazy when people are like, oh, spinach is the best thing ever, or kale is amazing, and that you know you see these shirts that say kale instead of Yale or. They just, they, they believe that kale is some sort of like manna from the gods. And I would say, no, kale has its own agenda. It doesn't love you. You know, yes. like, people may be able to consume a small amount of kale without having major symptoms. But I guarantee that if you overconsume kale, you will have problems. And one of the interesting things about the carnivorous diet is, will you feel even better if you don't consume kale? And I would say, yes, you yeah. probably will because you don't need all these pesticides that are in the plants. Does that make sense? Right. It's crazy stuff. Yeah, huh? um, yeah it, it is crazy. And that is like like taking, you know, the idea behind red meat being contrary to our current beliefs. And it's just taking it that much further by presenting a double argument on what, you know, plants actually contain and what effect they have on our body. Um, so you, you, you know, you brought up some really interesting points. I mean, I would say, you know, that there are people who are likely more susceptible to say this kind of damage or toxins that maybe are found in plants like for example you know when i do have leafy green vegetables it's usually a small cup a few times a week um, but then there are people who think that if they have uh, four pounds of kale a day you know that's the recipe for longevity yeah. and ultimate health right. or uh, optimal health right. whatever you want to call it right it's crazy and it's just it's absolutely not and i think we need to realize that these plants are not all good for us, you know? Maybe some people can tolerate plants, we can get into arguments for eating plants, which I would respond to. I, I would say, you know, at a 15,000 foot level, I would say that people say um, plants are good because they provide nutrients that you can't get other places, and I would argue against that. I think that's one of the fascinating things that's kept me so interested in the carnivorous diet. I don't think we know everything about a carnivorous diet, and I think we're still learning things, but there, there really is um, no nutrient, and I say that with, with uh, clarity, and I will uh, expound upon it. There's no nutrient in, in, in plants that you cannot get from an animal, probably yeah. because most of the animals are eating plants, so they're getting, you know, they're yeah. taking the, 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 you know, all the bad things and kind of metabolizing them out, and, or maybe they have evolved these things, but, um, you know, even vitamin C, if you, I, I do actually supplement with vitamin C on a carnivorous diet because I can't get the actual parts of the animal where the vitamin C is stored. So in the animal, if you look at it, it's in the brain, it's in the adrenal glands. And so I probably can't get enough vitamin C because I'm not actually going out and killing the animals myself. But you, you really can get vitamin C from animals. 
Um, and then the other right. things there, there are, there is nothing unique in plants. I would argue that humans cannot get from animals and people would raise their arms and say, wait, wait, what about all the phytonutrients? And so we can go down that rabbit hole if you want. But, um, I think the phytonutrients are really interesting to talk about. Um, many of these so-called phytonutrients are actually the plant pesticides. So right. polyphenols are plant pesticides and people need to know that, you know? So, um, like I'm just, you know, these are plant molecules that are evolved as pesticides. So we have also, so we've been told multiple things. We've been told red meat is bad and we've been told plant polyphenols are the best thing ever. And this I believe is something that stands on shaky ground and needs very careful examination. Like, so the first argument that we sort of talked about was that red meat is bad. And I said, oh, you know, there's really no evidence for that. The LDL thing is whatever, it's all bunk. So we don't need to worry about that. Or at least we've at least discussed that, whether or not people agree with it. The second thing is, you know, plants have pesticides, plants have toxins. And then the third piece was that, is that the sort of corollary to that is that plant phytonutrients, plant polyphenols are actually the, the plant pesticides. These are the toxic compounds. And so we don't actually use these in human biology. I posted on my Instagram today this really interesting paper. Um, I'll pull it up and tell you about it. Um, so what they yeah. did in this paper, this is really going to surprise people. They can go to my Instagram and see it if they have questions. Um, so what they did in this paper was they were looking at green tea catechins, which are a type of polyphenol, and they were they were hypothesizing that green tea catechins would um, would improve oxidative markers uh, in humans. But in order to control for other carotenoids and flavonoids, which are also polyphenolic compounds, right, in the diet, they had they had some of they had one of the groups. Um, limit the production, limit the consumption of other flavonoids in the diet. So both groups in this diet, so they had one arm of the diet where they gave people uh, hamburger patties with green tea extract. So this is a catechin, it's a flavonoid in green tea. And then the other group just got the hamburger patties, right? But in both groups, they had them limit fruit and vegetables. So they did a fruit and vegetable depletion study for 10 weeks. 10 weeks, fruit and vegetable depletion study. What did they find? They found, it wasn't carnivorous, the people ate other foods in addition to the meat, but they had fruit and vegetable depletion study, meaning no polyphenols, there were no flavonoids in these people's diets, right? They actually say in the paper, the paper is called, green tea extract only affects markers of oxidative stress postprandially, lasting antioxidant effect of a flavonoid-free diet. The title is not terribly revealing, but I will tell you about this study, because it's so interesting. And I linked to it on my Instagram uh, today, or yesterday. Um, so. What happened was that the green tea extract didn't change anything. The outcomes in the study were they were looking at 8-hydroxy, 2-deoxy guanosine, which is that mouthful of a molecule that is connected with DNA damage. And they were looking at serum markers of, of uh, oxidation in the plasma and the DNA. So that's what they were looking at. They were looking at DNA damage um, via oxidation via 8-hydroxy, 2-deoxy guanosine and a couple other markers. The green tea extract did nothing. But what they found was that the amount of oxidation in the blood was lower on the 10 weeks of fruit and vegetable deprivation. And the amount of 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, which is a marker of DNA damage, was lower. So the people in the both arms of the study had a lower amount of DNA damage, a lower amount of oxidative stress after 10 weeks of fruit and vegetable deprivation. So this, this, wow. this flies in the face of the idea that polyphenols are so good for us. And I think it raises this very interesting idea, like, wait a minute, maybe the DNA damage is coming from plants in the first place, you know, in which case, right. the idea of sulforaphane is kind of moot. Like, why the hell do you want to eat a bunch of sulforaphane if you're just getting a bunch of DNA damage from other things? Like, yeah, maybe there are some molecules in plants that if you isolate them, or if you do this, or if you use, look at them, like under a microscope, and you don't look at the net effect of the plants, are going to create, you know, are slightly toxic, and the glutathione is going to go up, and the DNA damage is going to go down. But why if you don't have dna damage in the first place what do you need them for right like it doesn't make any sense to me yeah so it's just that that study is just so crazy to me that 10 weeks of fruit and vegetable deprivation resulted in lower levels of dna damage so it's just this idea that like polyphenols are not the end all and be all and ultimately we need to look at the net effect of all these things and say like well isn't the, the net effect is what we want to know like we want to have the lowest amount of dna damage possible and um, you know, there's a, there's a really viable hypothesis that we can do that without plants. Like maybe plants are mm -hmm. working against it. 
Right. One of the things that I did on my Instagram, I talked about this a few weeks ago, I publish a lot of my blood work on there. Um, I've actually done this test on myself on a carnivorous diet, and it's quite low. So the units and the numbers may not mean a whole lot to people, but if they go on my Instagram, you can see um, from a couple of weeks ago, I actually posted my numbers for 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine um, on a fully carnivorous diet, and they were very, very low. So I believe the number was three. Um, and people can see that and that number is lower than I've had on a paleo diet in the past which is interesting so that I is, like to kind of back it all up yeah that, that is interesting and then it's always good to back things up with, with science and numbers um, and I know like like you said antioxidants I think that like, a lot of the points you raised were interesting I mean things that I'd never even heard about um, but I understand you know coming from things like acai berry and pomegranate and now you see they're being marketed in fruit <clears throat> juices and so i mean on a fundamental level same way that oranges were advertised as being really good for you and then turned into orange juice i mean there's always ways of pushing agendas like uh, pomegranate when pomegranate juice came out a couple of years ago it was like the new super fruit uh oh, if yeah. you look at a bottle of pomegranate juice it's got like 60 grams of sugar i'm like it's not that much different than having uh, candy bar. I mean, you're still having 60 grams of sugar in liquid form. All right. Um, and it's, it, I mean, people just think antioxidants are yeah, all of a sudden it avoids all the harms of sugar that are in that drink, right? Which is so counterintuitive. You're taking something, but then you're taking in something that's way worse for you. So like you said, the net effect of drinking pomegranate juice is horrendous. <clears throat> it's probably horrendous and we don't really absorb. One of the other things that's so interesting to me is if you look at what the body does, right? the body does not absorb most of these, um, yeah. you know, like curcumin is really poorly absorbed by the body. So what is going on here? If this is so good for us, why don't we absorb it? You know, the body doesn't want it. The mm. body doesn't want curcumin. Mm. We don't use plant molecules in our endogenous biochemistry. So you think basically what we've got going on here is this idea that like you're looking at two different species, you know, like widely different species. You're looking at a Ferrari and a Honda. And the parts in those two things do not work. You cannot take a carburetor out of a Honda and put it in a Ferrari. You cannot right. take curcumin out of turmeric and expect it to participate in human biochemistry integrally. Yeah. You know, the only mechanism by which plant polyphenols could hypothetically be beneficial is as a hormetic. That is, mm -hmm. in being small toxins <clears throat> and increasing glutathione. They do not participate directly in our own biosynthetic mm -hmm. biochemistry. So that's something that's widely misunderstood. I will, yeah. I will hope to disabuse people of that notion quite Yeah, poorly. I mean, it's similar to um, <clears throat> to uh, a lot of other things. One second here. Um, like if you look at uh, resveratrol, right? Yeah. Like when I went into my lab, that w that's what they wanted me to study. You know, my, my, uh, my professor was like, this is our research. You know, it's it, it was promising in, in rats and and then he, he gave me a warning like, well, it hasn't been promising in humans. It, you have to take an enormous amount. Like the, the dose you need to take for it to be absorbed is insane. And it doesn't even really get absorbed. So a lot of things will show promise in animal studies, for example, mice or rats. Right. But they have no clinical application in humans. Yet resveratrol is still being marketed and sold over the counter <clears throat> as red, you know, red wine grape extract that is supposed to, you know, lower it's supposed to mimic caloric restriction like there's so many things that are tagged with it that are completely false and they're they're not showing humans whatsoever yeah i know that the rabbit hole with resveratrol and the sirtuin genes is something that's quite interesting but um i think that a lot of the a lot of the discussion around longevity and sirtuins and all of these things really misses the forest for the trees um i think that the most powerful interventions that we can do are around the food that we put in our dot in our mouths you know i mean Mm -hmm. I've said this on other podcasts before, you know, we, we ingest milligram or microgram quantities of, uh, pharmaceuticals, but we ingest kilogram quantities. This is multiple orders of magnitude different. We ingest kilogram quantities mm -hmm. of food. So we are talking, you know, multiple orders of magnitude. We are talking hundreds to thousands of times more food than we are. And it's all molecules, right? Food is just molecules, mm -hmm. but we are having so much more food. That's going to have such a greater effect. And I would argue that the single greatest thing we can do and uh, is is to is to ensure insulin sensitivity and to 
to really reverse insulin resistance. Everything else is just icing on the cake at this point. There should be no mm. discussion of sirtuins, longevity, or any of these things. Like you cannot have a discussion about longevity or optimized health with, with someone who does not have a very, very good insulin sensitivity. That just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, people are saying mm. like, I'll hear this on podcasts. I won't name podcasts, but I'll hear this on podcasts. They're talking about sirtuins, they're talking about mTOR, they're talking about longevity, they're talking about you know the NLR, P3, inflammasome, and then they'll say on the podcast, where are we gonna eat after this podcast? And they're gonna go eat freaking like, you know, stuff that's gonna completely mess up their insulin resistance. They're gonna go eat bread and like, you know, like, oh, I like, well, let's go to the Indian place, I like the naan there. Or you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, wait a minute, you guys, like, this is all just like, I, this is all just like window dressing. Like, just do the, just do the diet right. Like, I heard a podcast the other day and these guys were talking about, um, <clears throat> they were talking about longevity and they were talking about met, uh, metformin and rapamycin and um, you know, the, the, the researcher who was talking about this said, yeah, I take metformin because I'm pre-diabetic and I thought, well, <laughs> you know, like I'm pretty sure that's correctable, you know, <laughs> like this yeah. very well-known researcher in the field of metformin, they're doing a trial called the TAME trial, which is looking at metformin for longevity. Well, you know, like, wh why are we even having conversations about metformin for longevity when, when we haven't made the diet ideal? And nobody really knows what the ideal diet is, but there should be no evidence of insulin resistance, you know, if we're talking about metformin for longevity. That's just like, that's not even relevant to me, you know? Like, you could improve yeah. your diet. Like, this is the main researcher on the TAME trial saying, I take metformin because I'm pre-diabetic. And I'm thinking, like, okay, what, what, like, this goes back to what you were saying earlier. Like, that is his choice. Like, if you choose to eat that way, that's fine. You know, if you if that's the quality of life that you want, and metformin is the way to go, that's fine. But like, there are absolute interventions you could do. you could get rid of your insulin resistance in the first place. That'll probably improve your longevity more than metformin. It's yeah. absolutely going to do that. You know, there's no question about the the yeah. the, the influence of those. So wild stuff. Um, give me two minutes. I I have to end this call and call you back. We have to. Uh, switch out our, our uh, memory sticks okay. here because we're running out of room on the cameras. Uh, but there, there's like so much more that I want to talk about. So give me two minutes, hold your thought, and I'm going to call you back <coughs> call shortly. Back. Okay. Okay. One second. Sorry about that. But we're, no we're, all, we're all good. It's like there's there's so many things I want to talk about. And I feel like <laughs> we're just scratching the surface. I mean, I know it's like it's it's crazy. You yeah. Know, like people, like, we could do like six hours. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's why, you know, when I heard your podcast with Mark Bell, it's like, this is going to be super interesting because there's so many things that I want to talk about now. And when I had Mark Bell on the show, I mean, we went like almost two hours and I was like, where'd the time go? Because it, it just felt like there's so many things that I wanted to, to just discuss. Um, but I want to just quickly ask you about <clears throat> people with um, Crohn's and colitis. Yeah. Um, I, I have a lot of yeah. people... Uh, close to me who are dealing with it now and you know they're telling me that it's causing them like a lot of distress i mean severe amounts of pain it's hard to exercise it's hard to just Purple. live a functional life so how would the carnivore diet affect that and do you have specific recommendations to how someone can at least alleviate symptoms of those kinds of uh, you know the, the symptoms that Let's come count. with colitis or Crohn's. Yeah, with the Crohn's, yeah. yeah. So I think that we don't know uh, totally how the carnivore diet can affect that. There is um, at least one uh, published case report now from a group in Hungary called Paleo Medicina. There's a published case report of uh, resolution uh, of Crohn's on a, a what they call a paleolithic ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. which is a carnivorous diet. It's a synonym for a carnivorous diet. So that really piqued my interest originally as well. Um, the idea, I think IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, which is the umbrella term for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, are, um, are, uh, is one of the most interesting things because it's, it's autoimmunity in the gut, you know? So yeah. it's, it's like ground zero. And, you know, it's just, it's just wild. I think that, you know, I have a few patients that I work with with, um, with Crohn's colitis and ulcerative colitis and, um, I've encouraged them to try it. Um, you know, people are kind of hesitant to try a carnivorous diet, but I think that the published case report that I've seen on it is quite compelling. The underlying hypothesis would be, you know, Crohn's is autoimmune, and it's clearly the immune system is reacting against the gut. And so, you know, just like I was saying before, you know, is it a lectin that's causing this in a plant? Is it a pesticide that's causing this immune reaction? I think that there's a, that's a real possibility. I don't think we know for sure. 
But I, I've also heard, in fact, I, I think I can think of two instances now. I'm on a forum for uh, uh, Crohn's. I'm on a Crohn's forum, and um, one of the other people in the forum said that their daughter had Crohn's and was placed on a, uh, a carnivorous diet and was doing much better. And I think the medical team working with her was just like so nervous that she was going to have some major <laughs> issue on it. I mean, it's so radical, you know, yeah. like you're on an all meat diet, like holy, you know, like, oh my God, you're going to die. Like, well, she's doing really well. We don't, we're so surprised, yeah. you know, but so I have heard of instances of it helping. I don't know that it's going to help in 100% of cases. There are also, I think, three or four case reports of Crohn's on uh, meatheals.com. Um, and so I think that it's absolutely worth a try. And, you know, I, I, obviously, you know, I don't think anybody would misconstrue this as giving anyone medical advice on a podcast, no, but, um, uh, um, the, I think that, you know, the other thing I would say in, in defense of that statement is just the underlying idea that I believe a carnivore diet is totally safe. And we've talked about that a little bit with regard to heart disease. We've talked about it with regards to lipids. You know, I think you have to construct a carnivore diet intelligently. One of the questions you asked me earlier was a really good question, which is, are there dangers? Can you get deficiencies? And I wouldn't say there's any danger, but you can definitely get deficiencies on a carnivorous diet if you're not careful with it. I think that a lot of people out there are... Um, just eating meat and water and salt, and I think that's a recipe for a lot of nutritional deficiencies mm -hmm. and kind of uh, creates problems in the community, you know, around the way the diet is perceived. I think that <clears throat> our ancestors would never have done that. We would never have just eaten the muscle meat. You know, we would have eaten the organs. We would have eaten the connective tissue. We would have eaten the brains. And we need to think about what nutrients in an animal are in all of those different places um, if we're going to do this in, uh, carefully. So, you know, if people are going to do a carnivorous diet, I would say, you know, you can do meat and water and salt for a couple of weeks, but I wouldn't do that long term. Right. If you're going to do a long term carnivorous diet, I would be, I would be more considerate of where you choose the food groups from. And we can go into that. I've talked about that a lot on my Instagram and I have a YouTube video, uh, called four keys to a carnivore diet where I talk about, you know, some of the things that I think are important to think about. But I think with regard to Crohn's or also colitis, I think, I think the diet is safe. I think if you construct it well, um, it's not going to cause any of those. It's not going to cause any issues, and um, people can really get a sense pretty quickly of how well their their inflammatory bowel disease is responding. I think that what I've told people um, is just you know there are lots of markers you can follow in inflammatory bowel disease. You can just follow an HSCRP. You can follow a high sensitivity CRP quite simply, and and you know get a sense of how you're doing in addition to your subjective experience of your symptoms, whether it's gas, bloating, pain you know, mucus, blood, all those kinds of things. You'd probably know pretty quickly if your Crohn's was getting better on a carnivorous yeah, diet. Exactly. So yeah, I think it's reasonable to consider. And I think that, you know, um, you know, the other thing that people say, I, I, I'll just comment on this briefly. The other, the, the other problem that people have with red meat is gout. Um, yeah. and, th and this is super interesting and I, I'm going to do a YouTube video about this really soon. So Gout is the deposition of urate or uric acid crystals in joints. And the reason meat gets implicated is because meat is a high purine food. Well, there are other foods we eat that have purines in them. But, you know, if we look at gout and how it works, uric acid is one-third from diet and two-thirds endogenous. So we make uric acid in our bodies normally. And most of people, like 90% of people who have gout have trouble getting rid of uric acid. It's not that they're overproducing uric acid. But meat gets implicated, and in some people with insulin resistance, um, meat can tip the scales. But what I have seen, and again, I published this, I've talked about this on my Instagram, I eat three to three and a half pounds of red meat a day. My uric acid, my serum uric acid is 4.1, which is the low end of the reference range, and it's very, it's, it's very low. So clearly, meat itself does not raise uric acid right. in the absence of insulin resistance. And I want to make that very clear to people. Like, if that were the case, I would have gout. But no, it's, it's usually an issue with the impaired excretion or the impaired processing of the uric acid. Now, what else does that? Alcohol does that. Alcohol probably does that through a lot of mechanisms. But there's all sorts of papers that have been published about this, which are really interesting and people can find very easily. Um, there was one that I was reading before you called. It's called Gout, Diet, and the Insulin Resistance Syndrome. Mm. It is um, from the Journal of Rheumatology. I got to find the reference. It's from 2002, and it's written by rheumatologists. So it is well known that insulin resistance is uh, very strongly connected with gout and probably the main issue. So the purines in meat are not the problem in gout. It is the problems processing the uric acid, which is insulin resistance or alcohol. So 
if someone has gout and they're thinking, I don't want to eat a whole bunch of meat, yeah. But if you take away the fructose, there's another article that I've talked about on my Instagram showing that fructose, which isn't surprising because fructose can easily create an insulin resistant uh, phenotype. Um, fructose is gonna contribute to gout. Alcohol is gonna contribute to gout. I would challenge anyone to eat meat in the absence of insulin resistance and alcohol and say that they have gout. Unless there is a small percentage, they could have a genetic anomaly in the way they get rid of uric acid. But that's very rare. The majority of people who have gout are not getting rid of it properly because they're, they're having alcohol or they're having insulin resistance. So meat is not causing gout. Uh, it doesn't happen that way. And I think that the other thing for people to realize is if they're gonna do a carnivorous diet, they have to eat nose to tail. They have to, this is something that I differ from other people in the carnivorous space about. I think that you need to think about a few things. You need to think about the methionine glycine balance, which is the, these are two amino acids. Meat, muscle meat is very high in methionine, and by itself, methionine can uh, change the human biochemistry in a negative way. But if you balance it with glycine, you'll be fine. So where's glycine? Glycine is in the connective tissue. So you, this can easily be achieved by just supplementing with glycine uh, when you're eating meat. Uh, you can drink the free-form amino acid, which has all sorts of other benefits that have been associated with it. And it's sweet like sugar, actually, which is pretty crazy. You ever had glycine? No, but that's really interesting. Sweet. Yeah, it's sweet. Um, or you can do something with a collagen supplement. Yeah, yeah. I know you guys make yeah, a collagen one supplement. Yeah, one of my favorites. And that's, I mean, <clears throat> yeah. that, that like flies off the shelves for us because, you know, people, they take it and they report back amazing health benefits. I mean, yeah. one of the people that we work with, um, you know, she's influential in the keto sphere and um, she underwent um, uh, loose skin surgery. And so she supplemented with collagen, uh, which was under her own advice, but also under the advice of her doctor. And her doctor saw her for uh, a two or three uh, week post-op and he was just blown away. I mean, he said that he'd never seen skin recover that fast before. And collagen has always been one of the supplements that were just, it's just been so key. I take it every day, uh, one or two scoops, my coffee or my shake. Um, and it's been the backbone of like, you know, my supplements and, and uh, K-Nutri and what we're all about. Yeah, and I think that if people add, if people are doing a, a carnivorous diet, they're going to eat on any diet, whether it's keto, carnivore, paleo, you need a source of glycine, mm -hmm. you need connective tissue, you need to get collagen or glycine or tendon, mm -hmm. and we just don't eat the tendon anymore. So that's hu hugely important. You know, I don't really want to go into all the complex biochemistry around that, but suffice it to say that methionine is a methyl donor in order to buffer excess methyl groups, the body uses mm -hmm. up glycine. And um, glycine is a conditionally essential amino acid. Uh, collagen is a three amino acid peptide, just like glutathione. Both collagen and glutathione are composed. One of the three amino acids is glycine. And so if you don't get enough glycine, if your body's production of glycine is inefficient, which is the way it is for most people, I don't think anyone can make enough glycine uh, because of the way glycine is used in our body and all sorts of reactions, then you will not make enough collagen and you will not make enough glutathione. So we'll have problems with um, oxidation reduction will have problems with connective tissue integrity, which is, you know, what is the bane of most of the athletes in the world now? It's connective tissue integrity, whether it's collar with ligament, tendon, right. back, you know, crazy. And I think they're starting to catch on. I think most professional teams probably supplement with collagen now, but um, it's a huge thing. So methionine, glycine imbalance is important. I think people also need to realize that if they're going to do a carnivorous or a low carb diet, they have to eat fat. Protein is not fuel, protein is building blocks, and low carb. And low fat is starvation. Yeah. And people won't feel good. This is rabbit starvation. Yeah. You know, like you, you cannot just eat protein. And so if people feel badly on keto, I mean, if people are doing keto, they're probably eating more fat. Yeah. Um, but if people feel badly on carnivore, I mean, at least half the time, it's because they're just eating all meat and right. they're not eating enough fat. And, you know, grass-fed meat is what I uh, think people should be eating. And grass-fed meat is leaner because we're not actually getting... They're not selling the back fat. They're not selling the fatty parts of the animal with the meat. They're just selling you the lean meat, which is great, but you need to add extra fat to it. So people need to think about their fat to protein macros on a, on a zero carb or low carb diet. Right. And then you have to think about other micronutrients. You know, I mean, if you get collagen, you're doing some things, but you know, muscle meat doesn't have everything you need in it. There are many of the B vitamins which are not in muscle meat. Muscle meat has a lot of B vitamins, but it doesn't really have a whole lot of thiamine unless you're eating pork. It doesn't have a lot of biotin, doesn't have a lot of folate. Um, and, you know, those, those can be found in things like egg yolks, a small amount of liver. I don't think anybody knows how much liver we should be eating. It's definitely easy to overdose on liver and vitamin E toxicity is a real thing. But we need to think about where the B vitamins are coming from and we cannot just eat meat. It's not going to give you enough folate or biotin or some of the other micronutrients. And then the other thing which I've found out quite recently, which is quite interesting, I mean, it's probably not too far from people's minds, is the idea of calcium. You know, where do you get calcium from an animal? Well, you get calcium from bones. Mm -hmm. 
you don't get calcium from bone broth. Unfortunately, many of the minerals in the bones don't end up in the bone broth. And so people can eat bone broth, but it's really usually just a, um, a small supplement for collagen. And I, I think collagen protein is probably better. Right. Um, but the, you know, there are maybe other things in bone broth, which are helpful, you know, N-acetylglucosamine perhaps, but if people really want to get calcium, they have to think about where they're getting that on a carnivorous diet. They can either eat eggshells or they can eat bone meal, which is what I do. And bone meal has the benefit of having other things that are in the bone, like, uh, manganese and boron, which I talked a lot about as well. So, you know, carnivore is a boron deficient diet because boron is only found in the bones of animals. Right. So it just kind of goes back to the idea that. If we're going to do a carnivore diet, which I think is really interesting, um, has a lot of potential to help a lot of people, we have to design it carefully and really eat the whole animal and know where the, the nutrients are coming from. You know, there was a podcast, my friend sent me a podcast yesterday, it was from the Paleo Mom, and she was criticizing the carnivore diet and saying it's going to create nutrient deficiencies, and I wrote her back on Twitter, I don't think she's responded to me yet. Um, I was like, I want to come on your podcast and talk to you about this. You know, there's definitely ways to create a carnivorous diet, which are totally healthy, have all of your nutrients, but you have to do it, you have to do it with some intention. You can't just eat ribeyes and water all day. You really, that will not be good. And that's why people get, um, get up in arms about it because it can create nutrient deficiencies because it's so limited. But if we eat the whole animal, it's a really interesting, um, primer or thought experiment about where we're getting the different nutrients, which I think is always something for us to think about. Yeah. Uh, totally agree. And, uh, you know, it's called kind of like you read my mind because you mentioned um, uric acid, and then you start talking about fructose, and that was actually where I was headed with my uh, one of my last thoughts. Uh, before I go there, though, uh, you reminded me about something. Uh, it was an email that I got. I got a referral through one of my friends, and I'm I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't consult with anything that has to do with um, diseases or or, tr or to treat symptoms. If someone comes to me and says, "Hey, I need your help to reverse this disorder," I say, "You know what?" Um, I can give you advice on keto, how to do it properly, but I can't treat any of your symptoms. I mean, it's just not sure. that that's not what I'm licensed to do. But one of my friends, um, her family friend reached out to me and he basically said that his daughter is dealing with a brain tumor. I believe she's uh, mm -hmm. about 12 years old. Um, actually, I had a few people come up to me recently and say that they have someone in their uh, you know, family or friends that is dealing with the glioblastoma and, and oh, yeah. the, wow. the forefronts of research with things like ketogenic diets, um, and cancer, which is what I did. I focused on breast cancer and keto in my masters, but, um, the, the main, the main cancer that we see a lot of benefits with and promising research is with brain tumors. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to cut off uh, the sugar supply to the cancer cells, um, give an alternative fuel source, which is very efficient for the brain to use. Um, and I'll just read you this email quickly because I think that you'd appreciate it. But essentially, um, I just sent him, you know, some of our keto manuals, meal plans, just gave general advice on how to approach a ketogenic diet, what to supplement with in terms of sodium and potassium, magnesium. And then he sent me an email. He said, um, as a side effect that I'll pass on to you anecdotally, long before the brain issues, um, her name has had problems with her lymphatic system since she was very young. She had a ruptured appendix about seven years ago and has dealt with swollen tonsils and adenoids for years and years to this day. Her hearing has been comprised because of the quantities of backed up fluid. I can't recall her ever having a good hearing test or being able to breathe through her nose. Doctors have suggested surgeries to remove her tonsils and adenoids. They've suggested tubes. They've prescribed steroids and drops. We refused surgery to this point and no drugs ever worked. And this is a young, young girl. Well, yeah. I can report after just two and a half weeks of keto, she had a routine ENT appointment. Her hearing is 100% in both ears, which is unheard of for her. Her tonsils are not at all swollen. She is breathing through her nose for the first time in many years, and she can smell again. Only That's the, so awesome. Only the adenoids are swollen, and we're hopeful that they're next to improve. So, I mean, it just blew me away. It, it just, yeah, I mean, that's touched so, so close to home. Um, and I think this has a lot to do with what you specialize in and what you were discussing earlier, which is autoimmune disorders and the body not being able to recognize and deal with certain food groups. Yeah, yeah. And it's probably individual, you yeah. know. Um, you know, I don't know. People sometimes ask me, are you never going to eat it in your whole life? And I probably will eat a plant. Um, yeah. You know, I think one of the one of the questions people always ask is, are there least are there less toxic plants? And um, I think that's important to talk about a little bit. You know, briefly, I would just say that I think that if we think about it evolutionarily, plants don't want to get eaten, so they don't want the roots, the stems, the leaves, or the seeds to get eaten at all, especially the seeds. 
And I would clarify with regard to that that seeds are actually beans, nuts, grains, and seeds. Those are all seeds. Those are all plant seeds. We just call them different things. They're all seeds. Right. Plants don't want their, their seeds eaten at all. Never. Yeah. So they, they have all kind. They will defend their seeds very well. And if you look at like apple seeds, there's like arsenic or cyanide. I mean, you know, you look at this, the pit of a stone fruit, like the little almond looking thing in a peach has, I think it's again, arsenic or cyanide. Like this is no, wow. it's no joke. Yeah. Like you don't want to go around yeah. eating those things. Like I remember they used to put like almond, uh, not almond, uh, but like apricot seeds that look like almonds in trail mix. And they, the FDA like cracked down on that because you could actually get a bag of trail mix that had so much that it could hurt you. You know, like three or four of those was like potentially a very damaging dose of, I forget if it's cyanide or arsenic off the top of my head, but it's a right. really, arsenic, it's a really big deal. Like wow. plants put horrible stuff in their seeds. <clears throat> like, so people were asking me on my Instagram today because I posted this article about um, plant polyphenols and they said, what about chocolate? Well, chocolate is derived from a plant seed. So I, I, I really, I mean, people can have all sorts of benefits to chocolate, but again, I'm thinking, man, chocolate is, could really, really be a big immunologic trigger, and there's gonna be pesticides in the chocolate as well. Just because chocolate tastes great when you combine it with sugar and dairy, and it makes something that people go crazy for, does not mean it's good for you. And yeah. you know, there are things in chocolate, people say, oh, it has a lot of magnesium, I would argue there's a ton of phytic acid, you're probably not gonna absorb any of the magnesium in chocolate. Um, but you know, like I, I actually don't believe that um, that cacao is a great thing for people for the same reasons, just evolutionarily, the plant did not make chocolate bars. The plant made, you know, a seed that it wants to reproduce with, and it put a bunch of pesticides in there. So we need to really step back and say, are there negative things in there, and what's the net benefit, or the net, what's the net effect? You know, is it a net benefit? Is it a net loss? The only part of a plant that, generally speaking, but not all the time, is thought to be less toxic is a fruit, um, because a, a, a plant is actually trying to get a, an animal to eat that. It's mm -hmm. it's it's re, it's absolutely doing the opposite with the rest of its uh, body and leaves. It doesn't want an animal to eat those things. But a fruit, I think, is potentially the least toxic part of a plant. Now, not every fruit is good for you. You know, like you, you get like juniper berries or some kind of berries. I remember growing up, they're poisonous. And there are poisonous berries out there. But generally speaking, fruit has less of, uh, probably has less of these plant pesticides for these exact reasons. You know, plants want you to eat it to distribute their seeds. Do I think we should just eat fruit without regard? No, I think it doesn't make any sense. I think that we know that fruit is sugar, and even if it's a pomegranate or any of these other things, like you can definitely eat too much of that and create insulin resistance with all the fructose. So I think that if we were gonna consume fruit, we may wanna consume them seasonally and in reasonable quantities, but that's also not to say, like, you know, you can consume fruit that's seasonal somewhere where you're not. I mean, that, you could, but it just doesn't make sense evolutionarily in the sense that, like, you can probably find a fruit that's in season every month of the year. You can be like, oh, well, bananas are in season now in Mexico, you know? <laughs> but, like, you just yeah. think, like, if you lived in one place evolutionarily, whether it was like Sub-Saharan Africa or the Pacific Northwest or wherever, fruit is only going to be around for a, fru a few months out of the year. You're never going to eat fruit nine months, <laughs> 10 months, 12 months out of the year. So I don't think humans should be doing that. I think maybe if you keep track of your insulin sensitivity and you're in the Pacific Northwest, for instance, you maybe, maybe you could eat blackberries you know, when they're in season in the Pacific Northwest. But if you're going to eat something like a mango, it's like, well, I mean – Sure, you can eat a mango in Seattle. I don't think it's a problem, but just realize that you know eating a mango in December and then January and February and March is not very evolutionarily consistent. We wouldn't have had that much fruit for that long. So, right, and that's so that's a fine plants, balance. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. No, in terms of the plants, I think that that's that's important to consider that there there's not a whole lot out there that plants actually want you to eat, um, and I think you can overconsume the fruit. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a that's a really good point. And what I was just going to say is, you know, back in the day, if you look at the way our, our ancestors lived. I mean, we went through bouts of fasting and, and sure. being, you know, elevated ketones. But when our ancestors came across, you know, things like berries or, or whether it was seasonal fruit, I mean, they ate them. They weren't like, well, I need to be in ketosis. And so no, therefore exactly. I can't have this fruit. Right. Like it was, it was things were eaten for survival based on t time of year. Um, and if you look at there's a really interesting article, uh, maybe you've heard of it, but it looked at a group um, in the north northwest of Canada. Uh -huh. And so essentially um, all their offspring were born around the same time of year 
because they would end up um, having their hunting season and, uh, you know, having an optimal amount of, say, testosterone around January. And then, therefore, they would all reproduce. And most of the babies were huh. ended up being born in October. I mean, it was really cool to see that yeah. there, there's so much more to, to food than just eat and live. You know, it, had, it served certain functions and it was based on the time of year and, and you know, what was trying to be accomplished at the time by like a specific group of humans as well. Yeah, and I think if we, I'm not an anthropologist, but I think it would have been interesting to study more, but from the little bit that I know about anthropology, from what I've read and seen, like many indigenous cultures, um, when there are animal foods available, favor the animal foods over the plant foods. And I think that's really interesting that like, as humans, I think we can get in debates about whether humans are truly carnivorous and if there's actually such a thing as omnivory, <laughs> Um, that might be an interesting thing to talk about a little bit, but, um, I, you know, indigenous cultures seem to favor animal foods and if they had a kill, they would do that. I think that as humans, we can eat plants for survival, but the question becomes, do they create optimal health? And maybe, maybe for some people, the quality of life equation is not solved for optimal health. Maybe the quality of life equation is solved for community and that means eating pizza with their friends. But Ultimately, it's, it's about increasing quality of life and whatever gives you the greatest quality of life. I think you and I probably solve the equation of quality of life for, um, for optimal health and performance. And so that means I'm not going to eat pizza because the, the improvement that I get in my performance is better than the pizza right. taste. But, you know, everybody has to make that determination on their own. And it's an interesting thing to consider that um, that may be different for everyone you know, as they're thinking about that, that, that piece of the whole thing. But I think that, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think this is where the debate gets really kind of murky and this is mostly conjecture. You know, I've heard anthropologists and other people say that our digestive system is most similar to a dog's or a, uh, you know, like a canine, like a wolf. And those, those animals are clearly carnivorous. I don't think right. anyone suggests that an, an ant, like a wolf or a dog is omnivorous or is a herbivore. But, you know, we can feed carnivores, whether it's a cat, we feed cats kibble, we can feed carnivores plants and they don't die. This is an interesting thing to me, you know, like, it's just that their health is not optimal. And you could make an argument that that parallels humans, right? That you can feed a dog kibble, like dogs eat all kinds of stuff that is not meat. Yeah. You know, but dogs are clearly derived from carnivorous animals. Wolves yeah. are carnivores. You know, wolves don't eat yeah. sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. You know, wolves do not eat nuts. As far as I know, I could be wrong, but I don't think they yeah. do. And, um, you know, just because humans can eat plants and not die on the spot does not mean we are not carnivorous or, you know, does not mean that like, you know, those things are necessarily good for us. I was at the zoo recently in San Diego and tigers apparently are obligate carnivores. According to people at the zoo, they, if they don't eat meat, you know, or they eat other things, they get problems. And I don't know what sort of problems they get, but it would be interesting. You know, I mean, we have cats in our lives now and you know, my friend has a cat and she feeds it like grains. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why would a cat? Cats are clearly carnivorous, you know? Yeah. But it doesn't yeah. die. Yeah. It just doesn't live the most kick-ass life that it could. It doesn't live optimally. You're right. And and um, it, it's funny because uh, my girlfriend has a few cats. And uh, we, we, we started to look at, um, you know, how the cat was feeling. And, uh, you know, we switched his diet to this cat food that basically um was, was you know 90 percent made up of let's say right. salmon or whatever right. um and so the cat obviously preferred that food and so i figured you know if we want to prevent health problems down the road right yeah the cat will live 10 12 years on you know over the counter stuff that's basically just all wheat and whatever right. processed stuff you can put in it the same with the dog right like you can put a german shepherd on uh, a kibble's diet which i don't even know what's in it or you could feed it, you know, steak, beef, and chicken, but it, most likely in its raw form because I've seen a lot of owners who have uh, very healthy dogs, who have very shiny coats and, and good health and their hips have no problems, and they're feeding their dogs raw meat. Right. And a lot of people are like, whoa, what are you doing? Well, it's like, what would this dog have eaten like 100 years ago, right? Exactly. Or 200, if it was domesticated and living in your house. I mean, these things are used to eating raw meat, and they actually thrive, and they live a, a hell of a whole lot better uh, when they eat raw meat. Um, you know, in general, and, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but there, there's a lot of studies that look at, for example, Japanese populations and um, populations in like none of it or places that are close to salmon. And the bulk of their diet is obviously from seafood and salmon. Um, and they have some of the highest age expectancies or sorry, life expectancies. Um, and they have the, the highest overall health and the least amount of incidence of heart disease across the few studies that I've seen. 
Um, and so I don't know what your thoughts are on that. We haven't really touched into to seafood. We've been talking about a lot of meat, but uh, with regards to like eating salmon, for example. Well, I think seafood is great. I think that the caveat that I would say is that we have done a fantastic job of, of, as humans of polluting the ocean, uh, okay. you know, on, uh, in a way that can't be reversed. And so large mm-hmm. fish have quite a bit of methyl mercury, and I would not recommend tuna or anything large to patients. I generally only recommend wild salmon. And even in my patients and clients who eat <laughs> wild salmon a few times a week, I see elevated levels of mercury. So. Um, you know, I, I do think shellfish has a role. I think oysters are great. I think shellfish is amazing. Uh, again, there's microplastics and cadmium in shellfish. And yeah. so it's all sort of give and take. But yeah, I think, I think fish is amazing. I think you can overconsume um, heavy metals in fish if you're not careful with what type of fish you eat. Um, the other thing I would say, this is an interesting point. So I, if you look at the research on centenarians, whether it's people in Southern California or Okinawans, the, 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 the prevailing theory and the most uh, most of the research actually points now to the fact that it has nothing to do with their diet, mm-hmm. that it's all genetic polymorphisms in genes, in longevity genes. So FOXO3, things like this, you know, PCSK9, like these, these are, centenarians are generally people who have favorable mutations in their genetics. And um, I think that looking at um, genetic, uh, looking at food uh, is not instructive with centenarians because they would probably live to be 100 eating whatever the hell they want because they have such favorable genetics in things like FOXO3 and CETP and things like that. So, it, you know, they, they may live to be 115. I mean, my hypothesis, my, my suggestion would be maybe they'd live even longer if they eat, ate what we could decide is a great diet, whether it's keto or carnivore or paleo or whatever, who knows. But mm. they... If you look across them, you know, Dan Buettner wants to create this blue zones concept and I think it's totally um, non-founded. There is no there is no real commonality in their food that can explain the longevity. It's not the fact that they all eat beans that makes them live longer. That's absurd, you know. It's the fact that they all have – it's these clusters of people who have very favorable genetic polymorphisms. Right. That's really interesting. Um I just wanted to touch back on because we're talking about uh, dogs and cats, for example, and in I think it's in two or three weeks we have uh, Dr. Thomas Safrey cool. coming on the show. I don't know if I have, yeah. you've heard of him, but he's a he's a cancer researcher that specializes in you know the ketogenic diet. He actually did a lot of consulting on uh, my research when I was doing my master's. I I just I picked up the phone and I was so confused about where to start with uh, ketogenic diet research in terms of breast cancer because I was working with live uh, breast cancer cells and you know there hadn't been a ton of studies published so I went online looked at you know people who'd done keto and cancer and I picked up the phone and I just called I called his phone and he picked up on the first wow. dial and it, I mean it was awesome it's just like you know sometimes you just gotta That's take really action cool. and things work out right so so uh, he picked up and he was like hello and so we talked and uh, we went back and forth with the email and some of his PhD students and it was really helpful but he's going to be on our podcast in a couple of weeks. And I'm interested to talk to him because I saw one of his talks where he was looking at pets and cancer. And so there is a high instance of oh, uh, yeah. tumors in pets, obviously. And uh, they so did a case study where they this woman had a pet uh, that had a brain tumor. In, uh, sorry, not a brain tumor. It had a tumor and you could see it on its face. It was, uh, right. it was growing. And so they put it on a, an all meat diet. They say essentially uh-huh. a carnivore, whatever you want to call it. And it took photos over the course of three months or two months. And in the photos, you could see the tumor shrink and shrink and shrink. And eventually, cancer disappeared. And so they did that by putting the dog back on the diet it was right. supposed to eat instead of feeding it things that were eventually processed. Uh, I, sugar think that, yeah. I think the domesticated animals give us a real canary in the coal mine idea, you know, like, and we just, we are domesticated as humans. And I think it's this really interesting idea, you know, like maybe we're carnivorous, maybe we're, you know, maybe we should be eating uh, keto. I don't know, but it's, it's really pretty fascinating idea. So yeah, it's really yeah. Cool stuff. Um, yeah. So my last point that I want to talk about because you know you mentioned fructose and uric acid and one of my grad courses um, was obviously on nutrition and so I did a big presentation on this paper called alcohol sorry um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, it was basically looking at the role of sure. fructose and fat um, and they essentially referred to fructose as alcohol without <laughs> the buzz and I don't know maybe you've heard of this article You'll it's really it popular um, it's one of the yeah it's one of the most popular articles that looks at uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and the role that fructose has in it. But essentially, um, they looked at the idea that people blame fat for non-alcoholic oh, fatty liver disease. 
And it's only because of what we talked about earlier, where high fat, a high fat diet in conjunction with a high sugar or high fructose diet is what drives a right. fatty liver, right? And it drives uric acid. It drives uh, leptin resistance sure. and insulin resistance. And there, there's so many negatives that come in it. And it happens in stages, right? If non-alcoholic fatty liver disease works in three or four stages and it's reversible in every single stage up until the last point where you have complete cirrhosis right, right. of the liver. Um, but it takes so long to happen. Same thing with uh, alcoholics. And, um, you know, in that study, they looked at the 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 independence of fructose, um, the independence of fat and the conjunction of fructose with fat and high fat and high sugar diet was the most dangerous to uh, the liver, which I found That's interesting. really interesting because it's something that I already knew. Um, they found that only elite athletes could benefit from small amounts of sucrose. And again, that's something that, you know, if you look at research, who should be having moderate amounts of sugar? Well, maybe it's elite athletes that, you know, deplete their glycogen almost yeah. instantly and they can use it to feel whatever workout they have. Um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the human body, there's only one biological, physiological process that requires fructose. It's a very small process, but essentially fructose is completely... Yeah, I, I believe you're right on that. And it, 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 it brings up this interesting idea around fruit, you know, like we probably would have eaten it evolutionarily, but, uh, you know, how much is too much and maybe we're better off without it even. I mean, I don't think there's any unique nutrients, right. you know, like you could say, oh, well, fruit's going to have more mm -hmm. vitamin C. Yeah, sure it will. But I mean, it is essentially just sugar, you know, I mean, and then the other, the other question around fruit is the idea like, well, maybe that's just the plant playing with our mind, you know, <laughs> like we may not be mm. getting any real benefit from, um, uh, from fruit. It may just be like, it's so rewarding to us that plants are like, ah, I know how to get the humans to eat this. You know, it may not have as many toxins, but then it's the question. Mm -hmm. Then the question becomes, is fruit a net benefit to humans at all? Maybe. I mean, it's a whole other podcast right. on cyclic ketosis and going in and out. Are you gonna, you know, are you gonna have some glucose? Are you gonna eat some fructose? You know, every once in a while. I guess there's not probably not a whole lot of glucose in fruit. So, yeah, it's yeah. super interesting stuff, and we don't think we know all the pieces of that. I mean, I think that when summer rolls around, it may be hard for me to not eat any fruit, but I'm pretty disciplined. I, if I if I believe it's not good for me, then I probably won't eat it at all. <laughs> but maybe a little right, bit. I'll probably right. do some experiments. And I mean, you know, I could do some experiments, eat some fruit a little bit, and then check you know, HSCRP again, I've been following my inflammatory markers, which I should have mentioned earlier when I talked about meat. Um, I talked to, I looked at all my inflammatory markers and they were all super low. My HSCRP was 0 0.3, which is just ridiculously, I mean, maybe not ridiculously, but very, very low on a full meat diet. Right. So again, destroying the notions that meat is inflammatory. Like, yeah. And I don't know if you've, you've heard of this. I just have to put it out there, but, um, I, I saw a friend of mine on Instagram she was doing this like summer <laughs> cleanse, and I, I mean, right away I, I was like, well, "What in God's name are you doing?" And then she had tagged the person who she got this diet from, and it was the medical yeah. medium. Oh my God! So, uh, and and I, I looked at, and I, I'm not here to, to judge anyone, but I looked at this guy's figure, and he must have been a hundred pounds soaking wet, and I, it blew my mind that people are taking nutrition advice from from someone that honestly looks like he is not doing well from a health oh, standpoint. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, you, you think that drinking celery all day is going to reverse all your uh, health ailments? It doesn't just, make, I, I, you know what, that, the medical medium, I don't understand the phenomenon. I, I, it baffles my mind how he has managed to write multiple New York Times bestsellers. Like, this is, it's yeah, marketing at its finest. I mean, I will not mince words. This is... Yeah. This is the guy is a shyster, you know. He he's absolutely yeah. stealing money from people, making stuff up. There's no medical evidence for anything he's saying, and no, he's just nothing. he's made. I mean, I guess he's preying on hope and dreams, and it's just to me, it is just the the lowest form of uh, the lowest. Yeah, the lowest form of behavior. I just I cannot respect the guy at all, and it makes me really mad. I mean, on a, you know on a, a similar related note, if you look at vegan doctors in general, they're all pretty emaciated. You know. <laughs> It's not a good look, yeah. uh, which should be enough for people, you know, but uh, it should be. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't mean to be overly critical. I think that it's great that people are thinking about what's healthy. And I think that's an interesting and important conversation regardless. But, you know, like the vegan doctors look really emaciated. And, and actually, you know, on a personal note, I was a raw vegan maybe 15 years ago. I did it for about six months and I was 30 pounds lighter at the time as well. So I've been there. I've been down the vegan rabbit hole. It was not good for me. I, I strongly believe it's not good for humans. Right. 
Um, well, you know what? It's been awesome chatting with you. I, it honestly just feels like it's been 20 minutes. And I could go on for another couple hours. But um, yeah, I think we covered a lot of points that were really helpful. Um, hopefully, we'll just have you back on the show to talk about what new research, uh, you know, comes yeah. out for the, the year and basically what you're working on when you finish your residency. It'd be really cool to catch yeah. up with you and see, um, you know, all the all the research you've done, all the knowledge you've built and how it's being applied. Um, to yeah, I'm super people, stoked so. about that. When I finish residency in June, I'm moving to San Diego to open a private practice there. So I'll have a, if people, oh, yeah, wow. if people are in San Diego, I'll have a private practice, uh, functional medicine and psychiatry clinic there. Um, yeah, it's going to be super exciting and I'm going to continue on the carnivore, you know, rabbit hole. And I think it's super valuable for a lot of reasons. So yeah, my website is Paul Saladino MD.com. My last name is spelled like salad and dinosaur S A L A D I N O. Um, Paul Saladino.com is my website. Um, I'm on Instagram at Paul Saladino MD. I've got a YouTube channel, which people can find by Googling Paul Saladino MD. And I'm on Twitter now at MD Saladino. Um, yeah, so people can reach out to me. I definitely do. Um, I do Skype consults. I do remote consults with people now for functional medicine stuff and carnivore stuff. So if people are interested in working with me, they can reach out through one of those channels and we'll get in contact and get people kicking more ass. Fantastic. Yeah, I just get people living That's a long and healthy it, life. Um, thanks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks uh, for it having was me, a man. pleasure. Discussions. And, uh, yeah, sounds we'll good, catch dude. Up real soon.